Hello and welcome to episode 82 of Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. And happy birthday, Mike. Hey, thanks. Yeah, my birthday was, uh, well, we're recording on September 25th, Sunday, so my birthday was yesterday, September 24th, Saturday. But, you know, technically, because we live in Japan, it is kind of actually today. Still your birthday in the U.S., yeah. Because I was born like, a, you know, in, towards towards noon. And right. uh, that would be uh, towards 1 a.m. in Japan on September 25th. Oh. But uh, I still celebrated it on September 24th. Had a really nice Italian meal over at Casareccio in Amagasaki. Um, thank you, Fabrizio Valentini, Chef Fabrizio Valentini and staff. They were fantastic. Hmm. And you've got your uh, fancy birthday shirt on today. I do have my party shirt on. It's, it's this all black, polka dots uh, and moonbeams over there. Yeah. You know, there are no moonbeams, only <laughs> polka dots. It's a black shirt with white polka dots on it. Like, they're uh, dime-sized polka dots. Yeah, pretty fancy. If we had a video, you'd all be uh, thrilled at my handsomeness. It's just, I look fantastic in this. <laughs> <laughs> you look marvelous. <laughs> I look marvelous, like Billy Crystal in that skit long ago. Well, there's a birthday, and unfortunately, again this week, we're going to have to uh, play the necrology theme. But not for us. <laughs> Obviously, we're Not here. Not for us, thankfully. But, but last week, we were informing the listeners of the encroaching typhoon, which uh, yeah. thankfully turned out to be nothing for uh, most of us yeah, it in was. Western It did get Japan, us a few days so. off of our day jobs, though, which was yeah. nice. But uh, but yeah, we it was like, uh, yeah, it was nothing. So it uh, it was just a cloudy day, really. It rained a little. Yeah. Anyway, so we were, we're fine. We're fine, listeners. Our houses are fine. Everything is great. Yeah. But we did lose a, a couple other uh, musical people this week, so let's roll the theme. Okay, there's the theme. You, well, you, you, you name this one since it's uh, another jazz guy. A jazz titan, you a might jazz say. jazz titan. First of all, uh, we're going to mourn the passing with a farewell to Pharrell Sanders, more commonly yeah. known as Pharaoh Sanders. Like an Egyptian pharaoh, except that he spells it O-A. Uh, the, the proper spelling of pharaoh is A-O. They, they do that a lot. Yeah, you know? I guess it was you know, just... He, uh, he, I guess he wanted that one. Adoption of his, yeah. his name into something else. But he took on the look yeah. with a cool beard and uh, neat hats over his yeah. career. And he's an American saxophonist for uh, people who don't uh, know his name. He's a member of John Coltrane's groups in the 60s. And he sort of took on the uh, mantle of uh, Coltrane's free jazz quest, uh, developing a style of his own with really cool overblowing high shrieks, uh, kind of harmonic yeah. techniques on the saxophone. He had his own take on the kind of sheets of sound uh, ideas of Coltrane. And his style is kind of like spiritual jazz kind of thing. He had a lot of spiritual themed albums over the years. He just had an, a recording that came out last year. What was the title of that? Promises or something? With the uh, yeah. Floating Points music Oh, right. Producer. I heard that one. Yeah. It's more of a new agey sort of uh, recording. It's kind of, yeah, a little bit electronic and out there. But uh, he was born in 1940, October 13th. So he was 81. He would have been 82 next month. And uh, yeah, yeah, I always enjoyed his... Uh, powerful sex he was like half a month away from his birthday yeah. and uh, unique styles so farewell to Pharaoh Sanders we're going to have a little tribute to him that just by chance pops up in today's uh, jazz selection so more on that later you know I want to mention if you're looking for a Pharaoh Sanders album uh, my personal favorite one is Karma from 1969 mm. it has the 30 minute track uh, <laughs> the creator has a master plan oh, yeah. on it and that is him like doing his overblowed storming the gates of heaven sax playing at its finest. He actually re recorded that with, of all people, Joey DiFrancesco, who um passed away just a right. few weeks ago. Back in I think it was around two thousand seventeen, he re recorded a very short version of that track. And it's very tranquil and kinda, mm -hmm. you know, sort of um relaxed version of it, which is kind of interesting. He uh <laughs> it's a very different approach. And the the amazing thing about it is he doesn't over he didn't overblow you know, the, he didn't get that sound in his old age, but when he played, you knew it was him because he has this huge presence. Yeah. His sound has this um, gigantic presence even in his, in his uh, 70s. It, it just, I don't know. This, I, I always wonder about that where some, some people just have, you know, they have this sound or this kind of, mm -hmm. you know, that you, you just know it's them. 
not that I can identify him in a crowd, but I can, I can identify him if, if you were to play a bunch of younger players and like he'd come on, you, you kind of tell there's a certain authority mm-hmm. to his whole sound. You have to see he's very, it's very present. It's hard to explain. You really have to hear it. So yeah, Pharaoh Sanders died September 24th, my birthday. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's really kind yeah. of sad. And there's another name too, right? This week. Yeah, there's another death this week that we were thinking, yeah, we should mention this. It's a little esoteric, but we said, okay, we'll do it if somebody, if we have to do someone else. And the other um, death is um, Art Rosenbaum, who was an ethnomusicologist behind uh, field recordings from the American South and Midwest across the spectrum of American folk music. So he was, uh, a lot of these recordings were, are preserved in the Smithsonian now. Um, he died on September 4th at age 83. September 4th, mm-hmm. that was a while ago. Okay, but they reported it right. later. So he was eighty-three, okay. and he was also a painter and a folk musician. So you know these these people lived good long lives and had uh, fantastic careers, and uh, were left with um, the recorded um, record of their uh, work, and that's fantastic. Or you know, that's what we're all about here on this um, podcast is recordings. So mm. um, that that's a great thing. Anyway, so there we all go, right. musical necrology for this week. And this week's program, well, we're gonna get brassed. This week, we've got lots of uh, brass and bones. Yeah. yeah, a lot of trombones. <laughs> I'm pretty excited. It was a good week of listening. Yeah, it was everything we heard. I, I really enjoyed it. I actually got through these um, uh, very fast. I really just wanted to hear the next mm. one, the next one. It was, very, it was all really exciting. Well, before we start, just remind the listeners that in the episode description, you can find links to all these fine brass recordings we're going to talk about. Look them up on Spotify or Apple Music, whatever streaming platform you prefer, or get them all together in the full episode playlist, all the music in one place on Deezer, our preferred streaming platform. You can also follow us there on the podcast. Just look us up, Adult Music Podcast. If you don't see the full description or list or the links don't work on whatever app you listen to us on, uh, you can always come over to our host site, Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com, and all the links are easy to see and follow there. If you enjoy the podcast, please follow or subscribe wherever you listen to us. And if you take a moment to give us a ranking, write a short review, that helps us get listed in the browsing category recommendations. That helps us get new listeners, which makes us happy. You can also come over and follow us on Facebook. Look for our page there. Get some extra info and more releases that come out during the week. I had a whole bunch of them because this week was a huge release week in jazz. Yeah, next week um, and the week after that in jazz and classical, there's going to be a load of stuff coming mm-hmm. out. Um, that's that's pretty much it uh, for me this year, <laughs> financially <Right>. speaking. <laughs> so if, it, if anyone wants to make a donation and help my uh, <laughs> my music collection grow, yeah. uh, please feel free. <laughs> uh, it would be a nice birthday present. Send me an Amazon gift card. <laughs> if you want to contact us uh, directly, uh, you want to support Mike's CD habit <laughs> or any questions or comments. Yeah. Support my just habit. Just get in touch by email as well. Our email address is adultmusicpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you and be yeah. sure to reply. I'm convinced that if I didn't have so many CDs, I'd, I'd probably be like a serial killer or something. <laughs> so, you know, I feel, I feel like you want to help me support my CD habit so that I can remain <laughs> peaceful and uh, <laughs> not go crazy at the... Uh, at the lunacy happening yeah. out there. Oh, by the way, tonight tonight's um booze is um I got I got I went for some cognac brandy oh. tonight because I don't know I kind of had was feeling uh, like I had to get back to that. Oh, nice. This is a um, Camus oh. VSOP. Let me get a look at this bottle here. Intensely aromatic VSOP. It's it's oh. okay. It's good. It's not like a a very smooth one, but it does. Man, I poured it, and the whole room just kind of had this kind of sort of um. Fruity I'm actually smell. abstaining until we're done, so I don't get all slurry in my speech <laughs> at, the, at the end of the jazz <laughs> section. You see, I feel like you know you 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 had to like kind of cut back, but I feel like I after the summer where I didn't really drink any booze oh, okay. at all in this podcast, I felt like I needed to loosen up yeah. a bit. So um, yeah, and you can see it's already working. I'm kind of ready to You're all loose. All right, <laughs> ready to talk. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna spill it oh. all. Spill the beans. Oh, by the way, I wouldn't tell you this if I if I wasn't drinking cognac, but I am fifty seven years old. You can you can um what? Is that surprising? No, I was gonna just say you look yeah, pretty 57. young over there. No no wrinkles or anything. But I figure you've probably got that uh improve my appearance filter on there, so 
Well, I don't oh, have that going on. It's just, just naturally. You know, it's, the, uh, it's the ladies. Yeah, they I keep see. me young. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Podcasters are the new uh, rock musicians, you know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> you shouldn't have gotten married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, my wife doesn't listen to this episode, but uh, I'm pretty sure she won't. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's get into the music here. All right. Our first, uh, we're all brass in... Um, classical in, in classical and jazz both but in classical it's a little more unusual to be all brass in classical um but i found three uh brass led recordings and um they're all great yeah. i have to say or were very good they're all at least very good we'll get to to that the first one and this is a pretty exciting one i thought a pretty interesting and i think everybody should hear is mozart e mambo cuban dances and this is by um sarah willis who is a uh a French horn player. She is American-born, Bethesda, Maryland, and she plays with the Berlin Philharmonic, so she spends most of her time in Germany. And she's also a TV presenter on classical music. And she comes across as this real kind of ambassador for mm. classical music. Like She does a lot of interesting projects. Now, um, she's playing here with the uh, Havana Lyceum Orchestra in Cuba with um, Jose Antonio Mendez Padron, and this uh, album was released on the Alpha label. Now, two years ago, I believe in either 2019 or 2020, I should have checked, uh, Sarah Willis released the first um, volume in this two-volume series uh, called simply Mozart y Mambo. And it made a big splash. Um, it was kind of one of those sort of crossover recordings. It's not really crossover. I mean, there are two yeah. Mozart concertos on them. But then there were all these um, Cuban arrangements with Cuban rhythms of Mozart's melodies and it was very popular um these kind of things do tend to be popular they're a little unusual mm. and you know people love cuban music in general so when you get like classical themes that they're familiar with in there it's, it's probably an irresistible combination uh, so this is the second in that and this is specifically um two horn concertos and then the rest are cuban dances that mostly don't have eh, they don't have too much to do with mozart but nevertheless there's we'll, we'll get to that when we do okay so um first of all i want to Shout out the uh, Alpha's um, cover art, which is fantastically colorful. Mm. It's just a just a pleasure to the eyes to look at this these colors. It's very soothing. <laughs> I feel like, and also photos. If you buy the CD, there are f great photos inside the booklet too. I wanted to look up the uh, the car on the cover. There's a pink car. I think it's a Chevrolet from the 1950s. I couldn't really make out the. Uh, of the head ornament kind of <laughs> logo. They're famous for keeping the U.S. cars going forever down there. They, yeah, uh, whenever amazing. they can get someone to bring parts back from the U.S., they bring them down yeah. and they keep them running forever. Well, they made great cars back yeah. in the day. I mean, and they were big cars as well. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're, these are the cars that, um, if you saw the movie American Graffiti, these are the yeah. types of cars that people used to go cruising in, and like uh, in Los Angeles back in the day. It was like a part of our culture and it's just lost now except for that movie okay so we have um these pictures willis is in a flowered print dress with a french horn and next to a gigantic pink i think chevrolet from the 1950s mint condition though <laughs> I don't know yeah. how that happens <laughs> yeah, especially in the hot sun of cuba <laughs> you know and surrounded by people including some of the musicians she plays with in uh, sunny havana cuba it's a really appealing cover by the way, the first line in the booklet notes, and she actually repeats this in her, uh, Sarah Willis, I think she wrote the uh, notes and um, the booklet note. It's something that I firmly believe in and mentioned last week. She said, if you can't dance it, you can't play it. And this is absolutely true of Cuban music. You have to, you have to be dancing it first, or you're just not yeah. going to play this. <laughs> it's, that, it's a complex rhythm and it has a very specific feel and it has to be in your body before you're going to actually uh, perform it. I, I said the same thing about, uh, I'm going to repeat what I said last week about music schools. They should have mandatory, if, you, if you're studying classical music, you should have uh, mandatory um, Baroque dance classes. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true of jazz. You, if you're um, if you're going to play swing, you should have mandatory swing dance classes that you have to take. Because you got to know what that feels like. You know, you don't have to be a great dancer. You just have to know what it. You know, you just have to have you have the to basic move to the groove. So you know what what groove you're supposed yeah. to be producing. Although I have to say, jazz uh, musicians who swing now swing pretty well. I don't think they swing as hard as they did in the 20s, though. But uh, they still get the they still get that feel pretty well. 
Anyway, uh, but in classical music, like the Baroque uh, rhythm song, some like musicians don't get it too well, and some do. I don't know. Anyway, there's also, um, it mentions, the booklet note mentions there's also a statue of Mozart in Havana Vieja. Um, Cubans apparently love and revere Mozart. Hmm. <laughs> you can see a statue of him there. There's one in uh, Austria, too. <laughs> <laughs> and they also believe Mozart would have been a good Cuban. Now, when I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. He was very musical, of course. But I kind of, I don't know, because I think of him in that powdered wig yeah. and you know, those Austrian clothes from the 18th century. I can't really see him as a Cuban. But yeah, he probably, I don't know. Yeah, I think he would have fit in there. Any kind of musical culture, right? Vien Vienna was the musical culture of Europe back in Mozart's time was the place to be. Okay, so the first piece we hear on this album, let's uh, get to the music, um, is uh, Mozart's Horn Concerto Number no. 2 in E-flat major, uh, Kirschel 417. Okay, first movement, Allegro. I should mention first, Willis recorded the third and fourth of Mozart's four horn concertos on her previous Mozart e Mambo album, and this recording completes the concertos with one and two. This is number two. Um, this particular work, according to Willis, is full of joy. And um, it also has a lot of dance rhythms. Now, please, they're not Cuban dance rhythms, but they're kind of dancey, these old European sort of things. And in the Rondo's bouncy 6-8, which is the third movement, um, Willis claims this shows that Mozart would have been a good Cuban. Now, one of the things I want to mention, this performance, now, Willis plays with the Berlin Philharmonic, and she's American, but I'm sure she's got quite a bit of uh, experience with the... Uh, you know the 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 waltz rhythm and th and things like that. You know that um, Europeans are about. Um, he, here though, this particular performance, it doesn't really go for a Viennese feel. Okay, which is kind of interesting, and this is why it's recommendable. It's a little different. It goes more for like it, it really accentuates the dance rhythms that are in the piece. And then that's that word is um, I think well chosen. Accentuates. It doesn't like kind of you know, make it something it's not. But it just kind of draws them out a bit more. It doesn't have, like, the Viennese lilt to it, though. But that's okay. This is kind of an inter interesting performance. She's got this really big, um, full tone. It sounds fantastic. She's she's very she's very loud. Her uh, horn tone is full, very far forward in the mix. Um, though the orchestral details all register well as well. You don't miss a detail if Willis is playing or tone, which is pretty flawless. Um, she doesn't really... Um, you know, there, there, there are no real flaws in that. It's all very smooth. Um, I do like the non-dramatic light way the orchestra takes this piece. It comes across as uh, more song-like and soothing in the rather smooth way that is presented here. And I'm always a big fan of the lower range of brass and reed instruments. And I enjoyed Willis's full tone at the bottom of her register, which she gets to a few times here. Apparently Mozart really liked going down low into the soloist's uh, range, too, because he does that in the clarinet concerto a lot, for which you need a special instrument, the basset clarinet. Second movement is a laid-back but appealing approach to the slow movement. Willis's shaping of the melody gives it a genuinely emotionally touching quality. This particular movement is conducted on the slower side compared to other recordings I've heard, but it all works well. Um, the approach is a bit old-school with its big upfront sound. These days, the fashion is to use smaller ensembles. This sounds like a pretty, a pretty big one, or a good-sized one, anyway. Third movement is uh, the rondo, and uh, this is this has a real spring. The rondo theme has a real spring in its step. Um, you could hear the orchestra really push off that rhythm. They like the uh, the they hear the dance rhythm and they just can't resist. Okay, they they draw it right out. It's fantastic. Um, they're really uh, clean, rapid, repeated notes by Willis just before the first minute. Um, this tempo is, again, on the slow side, um, but that doesn't detract from the shape of the rhythm. The slowish yet lively uh, quality makes this performance unique, and Willis's technique is so clean on every note that this becomes a one-of-a-kind overall performance. Again, the closest of the mic picks up every detail of Willis's solo line. I feel like there's a cheekiness to the pauses in the melodic line that isn't completely communicated here i think if you got like if you have an orchestra like a player who's really attuned to that they'll draw that out but here um they're more attuned to the rhythm they want they want that to be the uh the main things you get, to, to get that cheekiness out there, there needs to be like a kind of spontaneous quality that really isn't here for that 
it comes across as uh, unexpected in this case, but it is there, and uh, I did pick it up. So there you go. It's a good performance. Again, not it's a little different. It, it comes across as traditional, but it's not. It doesn't have much of the Viennese quality. It's a little certain different elements are drawn out, and I thought I found it interesting. And it's it's a good performance, especially given the rest of the program. Let's move on to that. <laughs> Next, we have a dance, a Cuban dance suite. Now, in this case, six young Cuban composers, I think they're all Cuban, all born in the late 1980s, um, were commissioned to write a movement each hmm. for this. It's six movements, basically. Willis calls it uh, the first ever Cuban horn concerto. The Cuban Dances Project was a result of the COVID lockdown. <laughs> okay, mm. so that's why we have this. Cubans play the uh, traditional rhythms in this suite without written notes, as they know the rhythm simply by growing up in Cuba. But melodies had to be written for Willis, and uh, Pepe Gavrilondo, or Gavilondo told the other composers uh, to be careful because Sarah, she's being a classical French French horn player will play every little thing you put on the page, whether an accent, a dynamic, or a coffee stain. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to be careful. Uh, that is true of classical composers. They will kind of draw out like everything that's written on the page. Um, the first piece is a son, which features the roots of salsa in it. Okay, so with the addition of the well-recorded Cuban rhythm, the music in this particular piece, the uh, Tamarindo Scherzon, you get that? Mm -hmm. That's a little pun there. It should be scherzo, but it's scherzon. It's a son, but it's a scherzo. There you go. By the way, the composer are Pepe, Pepe Gavilondo and Yacel Munoz for this one. The French horn sounds good in this context, but you can hear that it's not quite as malleable as the accompaniment around it. You know, it's kind of more, it's kind of a more kind of, I don't want to say rock like, because it is malleable, but it's not. It doesn't like dance like the rest of the orchestra does. Let's just say that. It's not really an easy instrument to get around on. I really can't complain at all about this. The French horn is uh, claimed to be the most difficult instrument to play in the classical orchestra. No matter, though, it holds its own well. And um, this is a joyous performance. Okay, the second movement in quotation marks of this is by Uniel Lombida. A uh, danzon de la medianoche. Uh, a danzon is a slow partner dance. Um, we hear Enrique Lazaga on the guiro in this piece. It's also uh, the danzon is also the national dance of Cuba. I actually didn't know that. This winds up being a song-like piece with the horn shaping the melody beautifully. It's interesting how the soloist timbre fits in with the traditional Cuban rhythm and sound. The orchestration is reminiscent of old Hollywood movies. Hmm. It's very big boned. Full string heavy in the melodic material. There's a cool sul ponticello in the strings about 15 seconds before the end. Listen for that. Third quote movement by Wilma Albacal. Guaguanco senchilo or sencilo. A guaguanco is a type of rumba involving voice, percussion, and dance. Uh, there's no voice in this, though. Gorgeous solo opening by the French horn. Uh, afterwards, the rhythm comes in with slashing strings, and the French horns get around rather nimbly at this tempo. It's an enjoyable piece with an appealing melodic line. Uh, seventh uh, track is, this is the fourth movement, uh, Jorge Aragon, um, Un Bolero Para Sara. Yeah. Nice name. They have these really clever little puns in these titles. There are a few more that are like that. Um, this has a piano opening with uh, syrupy strings commenting on that piano opening. Really, uh, it's an old Hollywood sound. This is a slow, heavy-toned, but touching piece with a song-like melody. Strings are full and lush. It sounds like this was orchestrated when the car on the front cover was built <laughs> <laughs> out of an old, romantic Hollywood movie. The fifth movement, Uniel Lombida and Ernesto Olive. This is called the Saracha, which is a kind of a pun on cha cha cha. Saracha. Sarah Willis. I like the whole feel of the cha 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 in this one and the low brass, and I think it's a euphonium that plays the bass line. A euphonium, by the way, is the, the traditional name for a tuba, the respectful name. <laughs> Well, we were just talking yeah. about this earlier. I really just like the word tuba. Yeah. I don't know. 
We're just supposed to call it a euphonium. Anyway, the French horn picks up the melody from that, and um, it shapes it beautifully. Uh, this piece has a lyric. Oh, it, it does have a lyric sung by a chorus that sounds like it's about Sarah Willis herself. Okay, so they mention her, but then it, it kind of starts repeating, talking about dancing. At a minute and 54 seconds, the tempo suddenly doubles, and we're off to the races with the French horn. Uh, she acquits herself well, so it does Sarah Willis, and this is starting to sound like a big space. The sound clouds a bit during louder passages, but without losing clarity. What is this? The sixth movement, and the last movement. Ernesto Oliva, I come un chagul passari. Sari being Sarah Willis. A changui is a vibrant style of music from Guantanamo province. You may have heard of it. Associated with uh, parties and festivals is the uh, changui. This comes across as a more atmospheric track with deep percussion and the French horn playing a spacious legato melody. At around the 3 minute and 15 second mark, there's some interesting wailing from Willis on the horn, uh, which is heard again at uh, 3 minutes and 35 seconds. So an appealing suite, really. Uh, she calls it a concerto. I think of it more as a suite, a dance suite, sort of like in the, with the idea of Bach in his Baroque dance suites, except that we get all Cuban dances in this one. Enjoyable. Uh, light. Really mm. great. It'll It's uplifting, too. Okay, so tracks 10 through 12 are going to be Mozart's uh, Horn Concerto number 1 in D major, Kershaw 412. And this one was actually written late in his life. It was probably the last of them to be written, but it's, it's labeled as the first one it's in one of those like mm. scholarly weird things. It just got known as the first one. It's only two tracks, and I think uh, it's only two um, movements, and I think that's probably why it was kind of... It thought to be a fragment, I guess, and they just called it an earlier one, but it's actually late. Um, the first movement is an allegro, and um, the sound sort of thins out for this lighter, smaller, or smaller sounding ensemble than we've heard so far. I think they may have taken some of the uh, the orchestra away here. You wind up accepting the lack of syncopated rhythm <laughs> without the uh, the whole Cuban orchestra that we had on the previous piece. Um, perhaps Mozart would have made a good Cuban. Anyway, um, Willis sounded great in the previous Cuban dances, but there's a feeling that she's more confident and secure now that she's in the Mozart concerto. Yeah, she knows how to shape these lines. I mean, she's been playing them and lines like them all her life, really, in the uh, Berlin Philharmonic and whoever else she played with. It's a difficult piece, though. I'm getting a sense of a good quick tempo in the orchestra, and I'm wondering if that's just because following the Cuban dances, it sounds like that. I really don't know. Anyway, they pick up on Mozart's sense of humor with the way they shape the fading away string passage at around 3 minutes and 10 seconds, which ushers in the French horns material in this section. It's a very happy performance. And yeah, if you're ever wondering, I often kind of talk about this, how music, classical music can be funny. It, now, it's music from this era isn't going to be like, uh, you know, hearing like George Carlin do stand up <laughs> or anything like that. It's going to be cute things like that would make you know, the uh, mm. the 18th century audience titter at its cleverness or something like that. Anyway, you can hear an example of that at 3 minutes and 10 seconds. Second movement, Rondo, and this is the last movement too. Again, we get a good etching of the rhythm from the orchestra, and this always has a big payoff to my ears. I really always want to hear that rhythm drawn out. If it's called Rondo, give me like whatever dance rhythm they're using. Usually a rondo is a dance. It doesn't have to be, but it usually is. The whole performance sounds joyous. Willis matches that feeling. All right, going on, we have some arrangements of some old Cuban songs that are very, very famous um, for Cubans and listeners to Cuban music. First one is Maria Teresa Vera, who lived from 1895 to 1965. And this uh, is a song called Vente Años, 20 Years. And it's arranged by Jorge Aragon here. This is a classic Cuban song, and there's a vocalist. It's Carlos Calunga. There are no um, in the CD booklet. There are no. There's no text for the the uh, song lyrics, but you can easily find this on the internet. It's a very famous song. Um, it's a sad song about a love that has ended and should be forgotten. It was from 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with a huge nod to old Hollywood. In this arrangement, it's a moving vocal and a very old school arrangement and production with saturation in the sound field. There is no, <laughs> you know, there, there's no frequency missing <laughs> in the range of the orchestra. 
Okay, next track, uh, Richard Egues, El Bodeguero, also arranged by Jorge Aragon. Um, uh, Egues lived from 1923 to 2006, so he's basically a 20th century uh, songwriter. It's a cha-cha-cha, this piece. Um, the title means the winemaker, but the chorus in this sings um, the words, Toma chocolate, uh, paga lo que debes, which means take some chocolate, pay what you owe. And it became an inside joke on this recording. So we're going to hear this. You don't know why they're doing this. It became an inside joke for the ensemble and Willis because she brings as much chocolate from Germany as she can as she can carry for rehearsal breaks because chocolate was impossible to find in Cuba at the time. Hmm. So she pretty much supplied everybody with chocolate. And I guess they thought this would be a funny kind of comment on that. Anyway, Willis takes the vocal line over the cha-cha rhythm. And it seems like she really likes the cha-cha form as she fits into the rhythm very well. Uh, her playing here is very pleasurable. Um, the song has a verse, but we only hear the vocal ensemble sing the chorus. And we don't hear anything about the, the winemaker, which is what the verse <laughs> talks about. Only the chocolate part. Last track, Edgar Olivero. And this is kind of the only combination of Mozart and uh, Cuban rhythms that we have on this album. The previous Mozart y Mambo album had loads of these. But this is a uh, pa pa pa, which is um, inspired by the Papageno and Papagena duet from the Magic Flute. If you know that opera, you've definitely heard this. It's really famous. Um, this is performed by an ensemble called uh, Sarah Banda, S A R A H for Sarah Willis. All these puns. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a Cuban salsa band formed for the fusion of Mozart and Cuban music in the first Mozart y Mambo project. Um, released two years ago, so they do all sort all of these sort of things. Mozart's melodies with Cuban rhythms, and that's what we get here. There, there's a duet. The horn, the French horn, is uh, Papagena, the uh, Papageno's newfound love interest, and the baritone sax, one of our favorite instruments, is Papageno, <laughs> one of the main characters in the Magic Flute, who's looking for a mate throughout as they plan their family together. Um, this this has a this arrangement has a cute piano line starting it and the duet between the uh, baritone sax and horn uh, puts the melody across well and with some comic feeling and it's it's um drawn directly from the opera and um the the singers have, they can do a lot with their faces and their tones and things like that but the uh the two brass instruments here actually mimic that pretty well and get a lot of the humor across as well an appealing end to an appealing album once the thematic playing ends the piano comes in, tempo picks up, French horn and baritone sax come back for the end of the duet with some rapid uh, repeated note playing. This sounds like it was a fun piece to realize, especially with its Cuban rhythms. You've certainly never heard it played like this. Anyway, I, I liked the previous Mozart y Mambo album, but I thought this release was even more enjoyable, mostly because of the programming. Uh, rather than mashing Mozart and Cuban rhythm, uh, they went for a side-by-side -side approach here, and I think I liked this better. Willis's playing is a joy to listen to. Uh, she's obviously really enthusiastic about the project. You can hear it in her playing and in her tone. She's got a big full tone and manages to get around on what is a difficult instrument to play quick figures on. It sounds like the album was fun to record. It sounds like it was just fun to be with all of these people um, in uh, Cuba. And that usually makes for a fun listening experience, as it does here. Unless you're a purist, you really can't go wrong with this. Um, it was a fun listen. And if, you, if you're not going to listen to, like, if you want the, the more traditional Viennese approach to the Mozart and Horn concertos, there are loads of recordings of them out there. Um, the most famous being the mono, I think they're mono, by Dennis Brain back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> and since then, there have been so many. So you can always hear those. But I enjoyed this. It's really a, a unique sort of uh, listen and take on Mozart. And it's really fun. Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was uh, overall lighthearted. The two Mozart pieces, yeah. uh, well, the second one, uh, it's only two movements, the concerto one. But even the, mm. the uh, one at the beginning of the recording is rather short. Uh, so they're just sort of kind of mm. bookends here with the, you know, the Cuban music being the focus. And they're rhythmic. Uh, they keep things moving. Uh, they put the horn in sort of you know new situations you're not used to. I thought the um, number five of the suite, the horn part, kind of reminded me of a salsa trumpet solo line. You know, with the figure she's playing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought that was kind of neat. It's all enjoyable. You get a little sample of all the different dances, 
the final tunes are a little bit more lighthearted, but they're really atmospheric and just put you in a good mood overall. It's an easy listen. The sonics overall and the recording are balanced and warm. They're not overly yeah. detailed, but it seems fitting for the music. It captures the atmosphere and the rhythms really well. Yeah, so surely put you in a good mood with this one, I think. Yeah, those Cuban rhythms are just uplifting, mm -hmm. really. It's great. I wanted to say something about the, the horn concertos. They're, they're, I suspect that they're short because uh, how, how many demands are you going to make on – how much demands are you going to make on a French yeah. horn player? It's a, <laughs> it's a hard yeah. embouchure, apparently, and it's hard to get a really good tone out of I'm always amazed when I hear people make a really good sound on the French horn, although I guess the world is full of people mm -hmm. playing in symphony orchestras who can do just that. When we hear those um, old recordings – or the recordings with old instruments, the period instruments. The uh, if you ever heard like uh, water yeah. music with uh, period instruments, the horns on there sound like turkey right. calls because they're they're really, they really warbling. Do. They're yeah. really hard to play those instruments. So um, I can imagine that has right. something to do but with it. It's an appealing sound, nevertheless. Yeah. I think it was. I thought it was exciting. Yeah. There's kind of an edge to it, mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, so the beautiful sound. Sarah Willis. She sounds great. I really like her sound. All right, next, the classical recording of the week, as far as I'm concerned. French trumpet concertos by Hüken Hardenberger on the trumpet. Really one of the finest uh, classical uh, trumpet mm. players out there. Maybe the finest living uh, <laughs> classical trumpet player. Uh, Royal Stockholm Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Fabien Gabel. This is on the Beast label, and if you're going to buy that, it's an SACD. So if you have the proper equipment, you can hear this in wonderful DSD. And, and let me tell you, on this recording, that really pays off. Although the CD layer sounds great too. You can, if you have a CD player at home, you can just buy this anyway. It'll still play. But man, this is this mm. is a fantastic sounding recording. Let's just get right in. Not only that, but you, the the thing is, I was kind of trying to notice how great the sound was, but the playing yeah. was so great that I was just so zoned it zoned in on that it's this is just pleasure on every level although the pieces here they're all 20th century french trumpet concertos and they're they can be difficult let's say they're not terribly melodic in lesser pieces. hands or should we say with lesser lips they can uh, sometimes yeah. come off as angular and cold because i think it takes a yeah. special interpretation and kind of a real unique way of phrasing to make the musicality come out of them. And I haven't heard them done as well by anyone else as he does on uh, this set of recordings. Right. Music from the 20th century, um, to bring the musicality out of it is a real challenge. And for a lot of years, um, people just didn't. They just thought, oh, we're, it's, it's just angular music. We'll play it like this. But in the past 20 years, people have been re- um, investigating a lot of this music and they've been really pulling out a lot of musicality out of it by the way they shape the lines um i remember that this that thing um it's music that uh, separates the men from the boys as they <laughs> used to say and uh this is a, the best possible case to be made for this music anyway let's go through this because these are there are a lot of um not terribly well-known uh, composers on this album. Not many uh, composers wrote for mm -hmm. the trumpet or for brass instruments in general, uh, especially as solo works. And then the 20th century, brass became uh, more upfront, as did percussion. Anyway, the first piece is by Henri Tomasi, and uh, this is uh, his uh, concerto for trumpet and orchestra from 1944. We need to think about these years. He wrote this piece during the during World mm. War II, and he's probably living in France at the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's mind boggling to think of these things sometimes. Now, this particular version of this it was with the original longer ending, orchestrated by Franck Villard. So apparently, the ending was shortened, but you know, it makes no difference to me. I never right. heard the the shorter ending either. This is the first time I ever heard this piece. But people who have heard it, you know, people in the industry, people who have played it probably would be interested in knowing that. Tomasi, as you will hear, was a brilliant orchestrator. And uh, this concerto is said to be a joyful work. I don't know that I mm. took joy out of it, but it was very <laughs> kind of, it, it was certainly riveting, I can tell you One that. One thing uh, brass players will get here is the rapid switch of mutes 
and unmuted parts. You have to be on your toes. There's not a lot of time to switch between the kind of open and then muted sections. Yeah. I was pretty amazed. I have never heard a composer give that little time <laughs> to uh, a, a musician. To I, I, I wish I could have seen a video yeah. of this, actually. The thing is also, uh, Hardenberger also has this... Um, he, he can really change his mm -hmm. tone. So uh, different lines will have a completely different tone. If you're not really paying attention, you might think it's a, a different musician playing at some time. Let's go through this. It's a three-movement work. The first movement is called Allegro e Cadence, or Cadence. It begins with a fanfare, I guess, as I guess a trump, trumpet concerto should. <laughs> uh, the theme combines uh, duple and triple rhythm. So if you want to count this, you, you need to be on your toes, too. The movement ends with a long virtuoso cadenza. In the middle of the cadenza, the soloist is asked to play in tempo de blues. <laughs> like, uh, I don't really hear much blues in it, but I don't think that's the soloist's fault. I think that's the composer here. Anyway, let's just talk about this. The gorgeous sound on the trumpet here. What a great tone he has. And a fantastically clear recording as well for this SACD, also on the CD uh, layer, or if you listen to this on your uh, streaming service, you'll still get this great sound quality. Definitely listen to this in the highest quality sound possible. It'll really pay big dividends. I kind of like uh, the floating, there's a, float a floating string harmony uh, with the trumpet playing lyrically with a mute. Gorgeous sound throughout. Hardenberger's sound is tight and precise and always musical, even in this music that can come across as not Mm. melodic in a lot of um depending on the performance we then hear the trumpet high up with a mute the whole movement is a bit cadenza like really with the trumpet often playing over floated orchestration and alternating between a mute and playing with full sound there are a lot of different sounds from the soloist in this movement the cadenza starts in the fifth minute and features a trumpet with a mute the bluesy bit comes at the end of the fifth minute when the trumpet plays absolutely alone I guess it's the tempo that's bluesy, because I don't hear much blues <laughs> in the melodic line or rhythm. Um, still, it sets a good tone, and when the orchestra quietly comes back in, we've got a Dvorak-style bluesiness that ends the movement, impressively played and well-written. Now, Dvorak type, think about Symphony Number no. 9, or um, maybe that the American String Quartet or something like that. It's... It's not really the blues, but it was his take on Americana, mm. let's say, and I think that's where um, Tomasi is getting this um, I, compositional idea from. The second movement is a nocturne labeled Andantino. It's got impressionistic orchestration, and the score is marked uh, like an improvisation. The booklet note says that these free-sounding phrases are reminiscent of the music of Laos and Cambodia. Oh. Now... We live in Asia, so we are kind of like exposed. I mean, I've I've traveled in Southeast Asia, and uh, I don't know how this can be connected to the music of Laos and Cambodia. I don't hear it at all. But anyway, take that as that's what the composer's note says. Okay, anyway. Uh, the trumpet comes in with a surprising timbre. Um, this is muted, but different than what we've heard so far. I'm not familiar enough with the music of Laos and Cambodia to comment on whether the thematic material calls them. I don't think it does. I mean, I've heard the music of Laos and Cambodia, but I don't. I haven't studied it. Maybe um, intellectually it does, but I don't count that as legitimately. You know, <laughs> it's, it has to sound like it in order to be like it. I think. Okay. Anyway, it sounds modal though, and I guess that's it. So, it's, you know, it's kind of a intellectual sort of thing. It's modal harmony. The orchestration is wide frequency, hazy harmony. The trumpet actually sounds a bit jazzy at two minutes and fifty seconds onwards. Um, beautiful orchestration in the quieter parts, with every quiet detail captured on this excellent recording. Now, please, my saying that. I don't really know how this music sounds like Laos and Cambodia, shouldn't detract from your enjoyment of this piece. It, it's really cool. It's, I guess it's the modal harmony that he's talking about. Sort of like the bluesiness in the first movement that really isn't bluesy. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the third movement, uh, finale giocoso, which means like kind of like playful, and to allegro. This has a long orchestral introduction with a harmonic ostinato and has a festive atmosphere. 
Um, this really does sound like early 20th century orchestration um, with a lot of percussive effects, but it's not a percussion-driven movement. The trumpet is high in its range with a lot of tough um, effects like rapid repeated notes. Uh, he gets to show his uh, technique in this uh, movement. It's a fantastic piece and a fantastic performance. Next is a piece we've heard earlier mm. this year on this uh, podcast. This is André Jolivet, Concertino, Concertino for Trumpet, String Orchestra, and Piano from 1948. Um, the pianist in this piece is, uh, in this performance is Roland Pontinen. Or Pontinen. Um, this work combines neoclassicism and modernism. It's in one movement, but there are three distinct sections that can be discerned. It seems to go fast, slow, fast, like a classical concerto. Actually, though, it's a theme with five variations, <laughs> which we'll point out. Um, it'll sound fast, slow, fast, so it's got a lot of kind of different ways you can think about it. Anyway, the Allegro first section, the first movement, let's say. If, we, if you're going to count this as three movements, um, the first movement would be the fast movement, the second would be slow, and the third would be fast. But in actual fact, the first movement, in quotation marks, is the theme in three variations. The second movement is the fourth variation, and the third movement is the fifth variation. So you can think about that. Anyway, the trumpet's theme is chant-like and mocking in character at the beginning. Uh, this is the booklet note that I'm looking at now. Uh, the first variation is uh, martial. I actually didn't find it that way. The second has a theme in the violins with disjointed acrobatic counterpoint from the muted trumpet. In the third variation, we hear triple tonguing technique while imitative chromatic du triplets are exchanged between the strings and the piano. Okay, enough of the booklet notes. Um, this piece has a pretty rambunctious opening that quietens when the trumpet first comes in, then resumes when he's finished. The trumpet gets a few lyrical cadenza-like passages between the mildly harsh chaotic rhythm sections. And it's pretty hard to make out the individual variations, especially from the uh, descriptions given in the booklet. They tend to blend into each other. But this sounds adventurous and acrobatic all the way through to my ears. The second movement, which is the fourth variation, uh, acts as the concerto's slow section and features a long muted trumpet cantilena. Um, there's a piano cadenza um, at the end, which is, uh, Jolivet says, is to spare the lungs and the lips of the player who's been really <laughs> playing all the way through so far. And the uh, piano cadenza also serves as an introduction to the fifth variation or third movement. Um, there's a pause between this variation, making it sound like an alternate movement. It's very slow and somber. The trumpet tone is beautiful, as we can imagine. And the theme is beautifully shaped by Hardenberger here. The third uh, movement, or the fifth variation, is um, demanding for the soloist and includes passages of flutter tonguing and has a coda at the end when we hear the initial theme in augmentation from the trumpet and piano before it ends on a high C major on the trumpet. Here we go directly into the last movement, or variation, which features the piano opening. The trumpet has a mute for its first appearance. There's a fantastic chugging rhythm from the orchestra at a minute and 15 seconds, which the trumpet spectacularly picks up. It's a fantastic performance right up to the ringing final trumpet note. If you heard this uh, piece the last time we talked about it on this podcast, you'll definitely want to hear this mm -hmm. performance. I think it's a lot, uh, I don't like to say better, but it's a lot more vibrant and yeah. it picks up a lot more that's in this um, piece. Tracks seven to nine is a... Um, Concerto or Suite, sorry, by Florent Schmidt, a composer who I've been very interested in recently. I don't know much about him, but he sounds pretty interesting from what I've read about him. This is his Suite for Trumpet and Orchestra, Opus 133, composed in 1955. Schmidt was in his 80s when he composed this. Um, the original version was a competition piece for the Paris Conservatoire and was for trumpet and piano. So here we get an orchestration of it. First movement is marked gaiement. Uh, the notes say this movement is delightfully seductive. Again, I didn't really pick that <laughs> up. It's appealing, though. It starts out kind of with a rather circus-like uh, feeling. I see how circus feeling doesn't isn't seductive to me. Mm. I don't know. I'm kind of... I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the circus. I'm just one of those guys. <laughs> you mean like get your polka dots on. <laughs> anyway, with 
<laughs> I, even though I got my polka dot, yeah, I don't think the polka dots relate to the circus. I don't think you have to wear the big clown nose for this one. Anyway, bass drums, a lot of low bass booming from the speakers. <laughs> Actually, this was fantastic. Mm. It really lots of good chest cavity sound coming out of the subwoofer um, for this one. It impacts the body out of the speakers. Very lifelike recording. Meanwhile, the trumpet alternates between jerky rhythmic figures and lyrical nocturne type melodies. Vivid recording, as I mentioned. Second movement, La Sans Excess, features the haunting sonorities typical of Schmidt. So this is really what he sounds like. There's also a harp in this movement. After the atmospheric opening, the trumpet plays its somber theme with a mute. The music swells as the movement goes on, and the trumpet loses the mute as it gains in power. Lots of gorgeous orchestration in this movement that makes me want to hear more of Schmidt's orchestral music. At 3 minutes and 40 seconds or so, the trumpet returns with its mute, and we head to the end. The third movement is labeled Vif, which is very fast. Breathless with complex polyrhythmic passages and flourishes. And um, bass drum accents on this uh, movement hit with a real impact on the body on this recording. The movement is fast moving. I don't know if I'd go as far as saying breathless, but there are a lot of intricate rhythmic patterns that are realized with miraculous clarity by trumpet and orchestra alike. It's a fairly brief movement at 2 minutes and 29 seconds, but exciting all the way. Tracks 10 through 15 is a work called Ons Lieder, so 11 songs, but there's no voice on this, of course, by Betsy Jolas, and she was born in 1926 and is uh, still hmm. alive. So she's in her 90s now. Uh, she just turned 96 years old in August. And this title evokes the voice, although it's not for the voice. In fact, according to the musicologist Xavier Hascher, all of Betsy Jolas's works revolve around the voice, whether it is present or only evoked by the instruments. This is um, really a one-movement um, work, but it's um, divided into six tracks, and they're divided by bar numbers, which we, I guess would indicate the beginnings of different sections. Anyway, at the beginning, it starts off rather hesitantly with the trumpet playing quiet passages with some nice tonal smudges in them. Um, the orchestral writing is equally captivating with various colors unexpectedly morphing. Um, you know, the French composers are really good at orchestral mm. color, and... Uh, Jolas is really no exception. This, this, there are a lot of really interesting uh, orchestral details in this piece. And really in all the pieces we're hearing on this album. Next we get uh, a section of bar 37 featuring the trumpet mostly in its high end with um, a very thin accompaniment in the light chiming piano figures. I also hear a xylophone mm -hmm. in there, I think. At a minute and 27 seconds there's a change of section. And then we get to bar 79, track 12 okay track 12 this begins with the trumpet spitting into the valve <laughs> i think is there is there a name for that technique or trumpet player there um i didn't make a note about no? uh that one here um, okay but it's kind of it's kind of the sort of thing that uh ambrose Ak akimusiri would do sometimes anyway it's it's kind of that kind of spitting sound followed by a rumble on a cymbal and a reed instrument makes uh, plays a thematic figure with a very thin harmonic accompaniment. The trumpet sounds is almost like a didgeridoo in this move in this section. Uh, the section is highly atmospheric in its accompaniment. No solid harmony to hold on to. We finally hear the trumpet in full voice at a minute and fifty seconds. It ends its phrase, and the atmospheric accompaniment drifts away. The uh, track thirteen is bar 88. This starts with a lightly chiming ostinato piano chord that the trumpet plays thematically over and the rest of the wind instruments counterpoint. The trumpet appears with a mute in this section playing rapid rising lines featuring all kinds of trills and turns. Um, impressive virtuosity here from Hardenberger. So we're on uh, track 14. Um, this is a new section starting with the trumpet playing a complex line in orchestra is commenting on that. There's a high, tight line for the trumpet with a mute, accompanied by lots of percussion. The sound changes so rapidly that it's hard to comment on it as it rapidly uh, goes by. At a minute and 20 seconds, the harmony moves slowly and themes become more melodic. The orchestra is playing strained bending figures and light percussive effects. There's a slight pause at the end, then we get to track 15, 
um, which is bar 196, and there's a cadenza in this by Hardenberger himself. He came up with it as well as plays it. It's introduced by a staccato piano chord. The orchestra plays stabbing, jerky staccato patterns as the trumpet starts its short phrase material. Lots of percussion accompanies, mostly the type that interrupts the rest of the material. Uh, the cadenza is heard towards the end, and it just ends on an inconclusive note. And then finally, we get to the last piece, and the first time I've heard this one, actually, another piece by André Jolivet, a composer I have liked for quite a while, actually, but I've never heard this piece. His second concerto for trumpet from 1954. There's a story um, in the booklet that's pretty interesting about this, how uh, when Raymond Tournesac, who gave the first performance, commented about his difficulty as he was sight-reading through it, Jolivet said to him, but Louis Armstrong does wonders in the top register. Why should this be impossible for a classical player? <laughs> Get to work. Armstrong manages it well enough. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, there you go. Uh, there are no strings except for a double bass. Anyway, he's 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 appealing to his uh, soloist's pride there, I think, <laughs> more than um, anything else. There's a double bass only, no strings. Um, and then there are all sorts of winds and... It has eight solo wind instruments, including two saxophones and a trombone. You know, they count as brass, but here they're adding them into the winds. And this gives the work a jazzy sound. Um, there's a harp, a piano, and percussion as well. Like the previous Jolivet Concerto, this one has a traditional classical form, fast, slow, fast. All right, so you're hearing this difficult music, but you do have that big familiar form to help you follow it. So you want to keep that in mind if you're listening to this. First movement, mesto to concitato. This starts with a slow, mournful introduction that features the characteristic sonority of the trumpet with a wah-wah mute. This is the booklet that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. um, this gives way to an aggressive polytonal dance led by the trumpet, which is now unmuted, and there's a return to the menacing mood of the introduction then a lively climax. Um, I wrote about this. It starts with percussion, snare drums, and light gongs, uh, giving it a little bit of an Asian feel there. The trumpet comes in with a jazzy, sad, wah-wah statement as the bass bows a response. These are all really yeah. unusual sounds, actually, right away. Uh, develops into a pizzicato rhythm on the bass and builds from there. The faster part is lightly barbaric and harsh, in rhythm with some cool sounds from the trumpet and orchestra. Here, the trumpet has a muted. There's a groove to the rhythm by 2 minutes and 45 seconds, maintained by the winds. Yeah, you wouldn't think of the winds as grooving <laughs> instruments, but give this a listen and find out how they can be. Uh, the sound suddenly stops at 2 minutes and 58 seconds, and the bass drags the bow across the strings for a slow, drawn-out set of tones. The wah-wah is back on the trumpet here, uh, referring back to the beginning of the movement, I really love the chaotic accompaniment at the end of this movement as the trumpet plays without the mute against the whole ensemble. This is an exhilarating movement in a non-traditional way. The sounds are really <laughs> interesting and not what you would expect. Second movement is grave and then piumoso. This is a slow, solemn, and bluesy trumpet soliloquy. This is according to the booklet notes. Reminiscent of what Miles Davis was producing with Gil Evans at the same time. And we're going to have more to say about that on the next yeah. album we talk about, interestingly enough. Tony Sachs said that Jolivet told him to sing this phrase as if you were playing Puccini. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but this sounds nothing like Puccini either. Um, anyway, it's a gorgeous opening, um, contrasting with the previous movement, which was really kind of brutal, um, with the harp and gongs. Uh, the trumpet plays a solemn melody over this. Uh, the trumpet changes sound to something muted at 2 minutes and 30 seconds. There's something slightly menacing about this movement. It has a glowering or glowering quality towards the end, like it's kind of staring at you in the dark or something. Anyway, the third movement is jocoso, which is playful. Um, it's a primal dance, according to the um, notes, a biting primal dance, close to the jazzy works of the 1920s like Darius Mio's La Création, Création du Monde, or the music of Kurt Weill. Uh, the percussion instruments take over until the trumpet with a wah-wah mute begins a dialogue with them. 
the piano plays a rapidly arpeggiated um, ostinato figure at the beginning, with the trumpet emphatically playing its theme above. The rest of the ensemble is in counterpoint. I love the controlled chaos of this. There are circling figures accompanying the trumpet's repeated notes. An emphatic percussion solo erupts at about a minute and 10 seconds, featuring mainly a snare drum and some harsh brass with Stravinsky and wind figures. There are hints of the rite of spring in this movement. Uh, listen to that two minutes and after for that. Rapidly changing rhythmic figures, both individual and overall, changing the section, are heard throughout. The trumpet keeps hammering on a high note at the end, leading to a thrilling conclusion. And that's it. This is an absolutely fantastic album. Uh, coming up aces in every way imaginable. Performance, orchestral accompaniment, sound, engineering. It's just great. What makes it even more exciting for me is that I wasn't familiar with most of the music on the album, and I took to all of it and want to explore several composers further. Hardenberger is well known as one of the world's great classical trumpeters, and he's almost preternaturally good in these performances. Another thing I loved about this album is its total lack of mainstream works. Uh, or actually, I kind of already said that. For me, it's always a joy to hear something new or something I'm mildly familiar with that's not mainstream in the case of the Jolivet. So if you want to discover some new uh, classical music, this is the album to go for. It's, it's really fantastic in every way, and I think it will sell you on this music. It was just not easy music, usually. Yeah, I've always liked Joe LeVay's works for trumpet. I have a few recordings of all of them. I think this surpasses everything. I, I found it to be, you know, some of the most interesting works of, for, you know, modern trumpet. Uh, they always catch my ear and I have a lot of different things going on. I enjoyed the Tomasi on here as well. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the Schmidt as well, too. You can't really put into words his you know trumpet playing it's just flawless technique uh he's doing some incredible things here you know almost uh mechanically perfect multiple tonguing so fast machine gun like uh, he's got these some of these pieces have huge interval jumps and he's just he just reaches uh up mm. impossibly smoothly uh and then he's got a gorgeous sound and a malleable tone uh, that he uses to match the atmosphere, what's going on. And then, as I mentioned, probably most important, it makes this recording stand out. Beyond the technique is the interpretation and being able to phrase these and play them musically while adapting his tone to what's going on. Uh, so you're not going to get a more musical interpretation uh, out of you know these works. They sound the best I've ever heard them here. And uh, I like having an adventurous collection like this too. It's a real statement to have all of these pieces that are probably unfamiliar to most people uh, here. The sound is great. The orchestra and trumpet balance is perfect. You can hear everything clearly. Really something uh, all people who like trumpet music and definitely trumpet players should hear. Yeah, actually trumpet players should definitely hear. It's not just the... Um you have all that great technique, but just his whole, the interpretations of this are really, they're just so spot on too. So there's a lot of like intellectual virtuosity yeah. in this as well. Just the way he sort of thought out these interpretations. Yeah, really great record. The next album, I, I really wish I had heard before yeah. <laughs> the Hardenberger because it kind of, not, 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 it's, it's not worse. It's just quieter and it doesn't come across as dynamically. So, but I, I don't want to make it seem like a letdown. It's actually a really good album. Uh, this is Quiet City by Alison Balsam and uh, the Britain Symphonia conducted by Scott Stroman. This is, I think, on the... Let me just check. Yeah, it's on Warner Classics. So it's a pretty major release. Okay, Quiet City is a piece by Aaron Copeland. And um, I think she rather takes... It's It's got an American theme to it, except for... Actually, it does have an American theme. I'll explain how... Um, that's the case with some of these works. But um, it's a fairly um, low-key sort of quiet album, with the exception of um, Rhapsody in Blue, which can get... But even so, this this it's sort of like a the, the version of it that we hear of it here doesn't really kind of... It's a bit more laid back than we're used to hearing it. Anyway, so, so after all the excitement of Hardenberger, we're going to have like a, a bit of a, a quieter album here. This um, album starts with Aaron Copeland's Quiet City, um, featuring Nicholas Daniel and the Cor Anglais at the beginning. Uh, this is um, it's a really quiet piece, and uh, it's an atmospheric opening followed by the trumpet line, 
there's a triplet plus a held note and this slowly multiplies and i guess builds the movement this particular piece is um i think it's supposed to evoke the city waking up at the beginning of the day so it's pretty tranquil and it stays that way it never really gets you know any to any kind of vibrant rhythm Balsam has a distinctive tone as well, but it's much different than Hardenberger's. He's way up front and has far more presence, while she's more understated and has this more like creamy, smooth tone. It's really lovely, and the whole piece has a quality of sleepy-eyed, stretching your arms and waking up-ness to it. It's mellow and atmospheric. Balsam is the lead instrument, but the thematic narrative material is passed around, mainly to woodwinds, when it's not the trumpet playing. It's very soothing and relaxing, and a lovely performance by all. This is really more of an ensemble work, I think, where the trumpet stands out. Uh, the second uh, track is Leonard Bernstein, Lonely Town, Pas de Deux. And this is arranged by Alison Balsam herself. This is from Bernstein's three dance episodes from the musical On the Town. It's another quiet piece, similar in tone to the Copeland, and very brief at three minutes and three seconds. It's got a bit of a Hollywood quality to it when it swells to a crescendo. Uh, again, the trumpet is more of an ensemble player in this, or one of several instruments who play solo lines. Third track, and this is really, to me, the most interesting track on the album, George Gershwin, Rhapsody in Blue, arranged by Simon Wright. Rhapsody in Blue is famously a piece for a piano soloist with an orchestra or a band or how, whatever arrangement you're using for this work. But here we get uh, the trumpet, playing most of the main melodic lines. It's pretty amazing to hear the opening clarinet bend, the very famous opening clarinet bend, played by the mm. trumpet here, as well as the uh, rest of the clarinet's line. I mean, she's basically playing all yeah. of the clarinet's lines, plus a lot of the piano's melodies. Boston provides the requisite bluesiness for this. This particular arrangement sounds more like the jazz band arrangement. It's got drums and a banjo in it. Um, there's a snare drum, too and uh, a quick tempo. The trumpet's timbre fits remarkably well with the clarinet's line, which it has taken over. Uh, the performance, in keeping with this um, program uh, and this theme of quietness, is rather low-key. The, the piano and trumpet share melodic material that was originally all the pianos. <laughs> I don't know how the pianist <laughs> feels about that. And, and the material sounds totally idiom idiomatic on the trumpet. Um, there's enough variety in the scoring where this doesn't become an annoying quality either. So it's a, it's the arranger deserves a uh, a kudos there. I urge you to hear it, as I can't really put across how the trumpet fits in so perfectly in words. Balsam's expertise with shaping her lines and finding the right timbre and volume is impeccable here. Um, one odd thing, textures don't seem to change much between episodes. Um, they don't stand out like they do in other versions I've heard. There's a uniformity of timbre in this. It's not a bad thing, but it rather makes the piece less brash than familiar performances of it are. And maybe that's also not a bad thing. It's in keeping with the program here. It could be due to the small size of the band. Uh, the trumpet throughout is a marvel, though. Track four, Charles Ives. The Unanswered Question, one of my favorite pieces, and to me, a piece that's very relevant for today. <laughs> anyway, the Unanswered qu Question is played by the trumpet. All the trumpet does in this is play the same melodic line several times. I think five, uh, how many times? Seven times. And then the rest of the orchestra answers or attempts an answer at this question, which just keeps repeating throughout. So the or opening of this plays uh, portrays the eternal backdrop, some kind of eternal backdrop, which is the strings at the beginning. Then the trumpet playing the same line is the question. The rest of the ensemble, which grows more chaotic each time the question is asked, ends in chaotic defeat at the end. And we hear the first iteration of the question in a minute 43 seconds. The question itself comes across rather matter-of-factly here. Uh, we hear it again at 2 minutes 38 seconds, less matter of fact this time. So Balsam is giving us a bit of a, the same line, a bit of an interpretation. Then the brief answer. It's stretched out a bit at 3 minutes and 22 seconds or so. And you want to notice how the answers by the rest of the orchestra to the question get more involved, dissonant, and agitated with each iteration. At 4 minutes and 7 seconds, we hear the uh, question for the fourth time in the trumpet. Um, quietly played. 
Um, Balsam really is an understated player, and she contrasts hugely with um, Hardenberger in this way. We hear the the uh, question for the fifth time at four minutes and forty five seconds, and at five minutes and twenty one seconds the sixth time, and here we're getting an annoyed response from the orchestra. Then we hear it played for a seventh and final time with no answer. So that's this, there's a big profound statement being made here by Ives that I sort of agree with. We we don't really answer the uh, the big questions in the end. Uh, the whole performance here is very understated, as is the rest of this album, and rather quick for this piece. Okay, here we go. This is the part of the pro the program that I kind of have a few uh, questions about. <laughs> okay, um, this is jo- Joaquin Rodrigo's Concerto de Aranjuez, the ad- famous adagio movement. And you might be wondering, well, what is this Spanish piece doing on this American album? Well, this is an arrangement by Gil Evans from Miles Davis that was recorded on the uh, Miles Davis' Sketches in Spain album back in, I believe, the 1960s. And um, it's a really famous album, and not, not to mention a really famous performance of this, an arrangement of this um, this movement. For her part, um, Balsam is playing really what is a transcription of the Miles Davis line, and I think that's a mistake because the, the, I don't think that can really be imitated. I, mean, I think when a jazz player plays something, it's a famous recording, that particular statement of the melody and things is definitive. And not just because of the melody and things like that, it's because of the, the, the whole tone and the whole presence of the player, the way it's played. You're never going to duplicate that, and the the original performance is always going to be, because of the nature of jazz, the best ever. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it, it's not music that can be uh, duplicated. Now, the reason that um, Balsam even played this is because she was requested to um, um, perform it with an orchestra in 2007, and I bet that would have been an interesting performance to hear. But if you have it on a recording now, you, you know it's kind of strange. You can just go to the Miles Davis and hear it that way. Anyway, this um, performance being that Balsam is kind of an understated player, it sounds uh, more cushiony in the ear than the Miles Davis recording. He gets a kind of, it's a bright sound, but it's 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 muted as well. But, um, the Miles Davis is special because it was a totally original arrangement created by the artists. Well, here we have a transcription and probably Evans' charts. I'm not really sure. They would have had to write it all out for the orchestra, though. It comes across as very atmospheric, Balsam gets a mellow and, again, understated tone. She plays the Miles Davis material in her own way, which is rather different than Miles' mellow but hardly understated playing. I can't help but feel that Miles had more presence in his performance. I mean, he inevitably would have to. Um, You really never take your ear off the trumpet there, whereas here the trumpet doesn't necessarily make you take your ear away from the orchestration. It's not a criticism. It's just how it sounds. I kind of just feel like this sort of project. It, well, it's interesting for the classical players that can get into the skin of the uh, the jazz artist, but for the listener, I don't think it really kind of registers very well. It's not bad. I mean, it's a good performance, but I mean, you got the original recording. Why would you not listen to that anyway? Next track is a continuation, part two, moderato of the Rodrigo Concerto de Aranjuez. Uh, Adagio, arranged by Gil Evans for Miles Davis. And we get the mute that Miles was famous for on the trumpet. Balsam really makes her own sound with it. Her phrasing is more classical than Davis's, and I'm sure that's by design. Uh, This works well. The orchestra takes its climactic material brassily and classically. In my opinion, something needed to be done here. I mean, she's playing Davis's lines, and I feel like you could have used the Gil Evans arrangement, but I feel like the whole trumpet line needed to be rewritten as well, you know, for the classical player or by the classical player uh, to make this work. Because um, the, the Miles Davis line is Miles Davis's line. He didn't write it down. He just kind of, you know, improvised it or however he came up with it. Anyway, track seven, Kurt Vile, My Ship, again, arranged by Gil Evans for Miles Davis. And we hear that Gil Evans... Um, timbral combination familiar from the previous work. There's a smokiness to the sound of the um, orchestra. Again, Balsam is heavier than Davis in her tone, but she's still sensitive and uses a more classical type of rounded phrasing. After the two-minute mark, the orchestra gets an impressive swing feel to the string accompaniment. The track is mellow, as is to be expected, and by now you may guess, understated. Okay, so in the end, 
This album is a pretty quiet album, except for the Gershwin, and it's rather restrained and also very enjoyable. I, I certainly don't want to um, take anything away from the uh, performances. It's a really good album. It's ideal for evening listening. I feel that the album goes for an overall mood rather than an exploration of each individual piece. Uh, for me, the Rhapsody in Blue stands out due to, to the novelty of the trumpet line in most of the piano melodies. Otherwise, the album is a bit of chilled out evening music for adults, best listened to with an adult drink, as I am uh, enjoying now. <laughs> uh, Balsam has a beautiful tone, but she seems to like being part of the ensemble rather than the center of attention. Her phrasing is beautiful and songful. The album's called Quiet City. It lives up to its name. I liked it. I'll listen to it again. I kind of feel like the um, using the Miles Davis trumpet lines was a bit misguided here, but I, I understand why she did it. Let's just say that. Yeah, I'm kind of down on this one because of that. <laughs> at the, I like the beginning of this yeah. recording. Uh, I really liked uh, Copeland's Quiet City. Uh, I really like the yeah. orchestration on this piece. It's sparse, but somehow lush. And uh, it makes her most attractive feature, her lovely tone, really come out into showcase for that. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. I thought the Gershwin was quirky. Uh, it was funny to yeah. hear the trumpet mm -hmm. doing the clarinet parts and then, you know, other things you expect with the piano. It doesn't always put the trumpet in the best light to bring out, you know, what trumpety kind of uh, parts, but it is really interesting to hear the trumpet doing all these other uh, type of things. And yeah. as you said, the kind of contrasting elements we usually hear in this piece sort of get more of a kind of rounding off. And so it becomes more uh, similar and flowing uh, through it. But it's not a hmm. negative point to it. It's just a, a quirky and unique rendition of it. Uh, now, with the uh, Gil Evans pieces, I, I grew up listening to these pe these records hundreds of times. Right, Mo and, most people heard them at least. If you if you weren't yeah. even a jazz fan, you now, I understand them. it was commissioned. When I listen to this, it just makes me want to go back and hear the original. Now, uh, that's yeah, me. I felt the same way. If the recording brings a new generation of listeners to this music and makes them aware of it, then I think it's a positive thing. Uh, but there's what you were saying about, you know, a transcription of a soloist lines. Right. The other thing that if you read about uh, Gil Evans sort of approach as an arranger, from what I understand, he didn't really l let the musicians rehearse. He didn't like his pieces to have a familiar and rehearsed quality. So he had a lot of st mm -hmm. top studio players and he would just try to go in and say, here's the, put the music in front of them. And he would often take the first take and he would keep that, warts and all. Even if there were mistakes, he liked the sort of energy that would develop uh, out of, you know, a musician's first kind of uh, take on something. Yeah, and, it, and I think jazz is all about energy, yeah. too, that kind of spontaneity. Even yeah. with his unique, you know, arrangements and, you know, he had this kind of interesting tonal blends in his arranging and things. Uh, so for me, you know, these just don't have the the energy of the orchestra. Obviously, it's been you know, transcribed uh, here and adapted uh, for this ensemble. And yeah, I would have liked to have heard her own original trumpet parts, even if they were written and not right. improvised. I think you have to bring yeah, something new cool. if you're going to do yeah. this uh, material. And it's the same. So Sketches of Spain, 1960, and My Ship is from Miles Ahead, also Gil Evans recording. That's okay. a few years earlier, 1957. And uh, it's the same kind of thing. It doesn't have that spontaneity and I want to hear something new. Uh, so if it brings new listeners, a younger audience, maybe her fans, and as you say, it may have come off differently in a live performance as well. But yeah, I was hoping for something new uh, being brought to these. Now, by the way, if you do like mm -hmm. this uh, Rodrigo music, because it is wonderful music and you want to hear the other definitive jazz version of the uh, Concerto de Aranjuez, you got to go to 1975, uh, Jim Hall's Concerto album. And that is, uh, it's just one piece on the recording, but it's 19 minutes long. And also on there are, I believe, Ron Carter, uh, let's see, Chet Baker, Paul Desmond, and uh, Roland Hanna on piano, Jim Hall on guitar, and uh, Steve Gadd on drums. And uh, you'll oh, hear wow. a complete 
I believe that's uh, Don Sobeski arrangement of the pieces on that recording. So it's a small group, but it is arranged and it takes this piece to a different level in a different format. So if you like that music, be sure to check out. It's a very famous recording, but um, every jazz fan should have that one in their collection. Yeah, and if you're listening to our podcast because you want to learn about music, um, you should definitely hear the uh, original uh, Rodrigo guitar concerto, oh, yeah. which this movement appears in, the Concerto de Aranjuez. I'll recommend the uh, Pepe Romero recording. I believe that was done in the 60s or 70s, but I'm not sure. And uh, But really, almost any guitarist you listen to on this is going to be great. It's, uh, it, it's a pretty it's fantastic wonderful work. work. It's yeah. the most performed 20th century concerto in history. It's the most performed concerto of the 20th century on any instrument. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I've read <laughs> yeah. that before, too. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you'll hear why. Overall, it's kind yeah. of atmospheric recording. I, I feel those um, Gil Evans pieces don't really uh, bring much new to it. But she has an attractive tone. And uh, as you say, mm. she sort of blended into these ensembles uh, into the tonal palette as another voice a lot on here, other than the right. Gershwin. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's a... You know, kind of unique themed recording. And there you go. All right. I don't know. Three, three, well, certainly one absolute winner, and then two other winners, kind of winners. I don't know. They were all good. They're all good. Let's just say that. Yeah. Check them out. Yeah. I was happy with this. I had a happy week. <laughs> all right. We're going to stay brassy for the uh, jazz portion here. We're going to go with all trombone. You know, there's never enough trombone releases that uh, come out compared with other instruments. And of course, piano, you're going to have tons of piano trio, and then probably sax. We get a lot of uh, trumpet albums, but not enough trombone. But recently, we've had some winners. We had uh, Michael Dees a few weeks ago, earlier in the summer, and now I've got uh, three trombone recordings, and I like all of them a lot. So we're going to uh, stay in the UK with the first one. And I put this one first because this is a debut recording from trombonist Dave Sear on the oh. Ubuntu label. Uh, this came out September 9th with the interesting title, I Always Thought My Thoughts Were Me. <laughs> now, uh, Sear is born in Luton, started playing the trombone at age eight, and he got a place at the Royal Birmingham Conservatory in 2012. Uh, he graduated in 2016 and he's been a freelance trombonist since then. And in 2021, he became an official artist for BAC Trombones. And then 2022, only six years after graduating, he joined the faculty at the Birmingham Conservatory teaching jazz trombone. So he's uh, heavily involved in the Birmingham jazz scene, uh, playing with jazz bands, uh, small group combos, big bands as well. And he plays other styles of music as well, ska, uh, but he feels most comfortable in the jazz idiom. What he says about uh, this album, or the notes say, actually, this is his quote here. Quote, the music I've composed and arranged for my debut album was influenced by my lifelong journey with anxiety and OCD. Uh, during the mm -hmm. COVID lockdown period, I had a lot more time to think and overthink. And it really dawned on me that so many people struggle with the same issues as me. And even though I always used to think my thoughts were normal, this inspired me to write some music, which therefore finally made me feel ready to release my debut album. So it gives you a little wow. insight into the title. And, well, it's a really swinging debut album. Yeah, I have to say that given the title, and if I had known that uh, note, I probably wouldn't have wanted to listen to this. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but it wound up being a completely different thing than I expected it to be. Yeah. And I want to encourage listeners to hear it. I really enjoyed this a lot. Yeah, so he's got some uh, original mm. compositions, uh, and he says some contrafacts. Uh, one is very obvious, and the other I'm not, I'm not sure which one it is. And there's a couple standards here, too, and arrangements of other uh, jazz musicians' compositions. And let's take a look at who we've got here. Sierra on trombone. We've got a really interesting trumpet player who I want to hear more from, uh, Percy Persglove. We've got Elliot Sansom on piano, James Austin on bass, and Jim Basford on drums. I'm going to start mm. out with... An original seer tune, Reservoir Retreat. 
So we're off to an interesting start here. It opens with a chorus of trombone and bass locked together on the melody uh, with cymbals synced in too, all with a real driving swing feel to it. Uh, next time around, Pearl's Glove joins in on trumpet and piano and bass shift to walking, the, or the bass which was together with the trombones off on a walking pattern. And then jazz listeners will pick up really quickly. This is a rhythm changes tune. I got rhythm. So that's the contrafact there. And Sansom handles the uh, B section of the melody on piano solo. Purse Glove is the first one up to solo. He's bubbly, bluesy, and boppy. He gets into the high register, takes some chances in his lines. I really like this guy's playing already. Next, drums mm. and piano. Me too. Yeah. yeah, drop out while Austin keeps the bass chugging for Sear to come in a few bars uh, late to the start of his solo. Uh, he starts out with some shorter phrases, then connects his ideas more and more. His lines include some tricky slide work, but I like the strong sense of snappy rhythm and swing in his playing, along with his nice full tone. Uh, next, we get some arranged horn lines to trade fours with Bassford on some drum soloing. There's more original uh, boppy melody horn lines that enter for another chorus to set up Sansom for piano solo. He keeps it rhythmic, tosses in some salt peanuts, uh, and percussive chords, <laughs> and uh, also some extended harmonic ideas as he works his way through. And once more, through the melody to finish up. And we're off to a uh, good start with a nice swinging tune here. Track two is the title track, I Always Thought My Thoughts Were Me, also Sears Original. It's a medium-fast swinging tune with a 16-bar chugging bass intro. Sansom adds in some open sounding chords and Sear and Purse Glove come in with the melody working in unison but getting a few split offs in the parts adding harmonies. It's a hard bop modally tuned seemingly with an extended structure of two extra bars in the repeat of the A section. So I don't know, I felt it coming out as 34 bars in the uh, tune length. Purse Glove uh -huh. is out of the gate with a trumpet solo uh, just over the drums. Uh, so he's free-flowing here, uh, making his own harmonic landscape, uh, line starting low, going way up high. Keeps things kind of out there harmonically for a while before getting a bit more gentle. The others join back in on a new melody section with Sear and Austin working a line together before Porosclub joins back in. I like how Basford changes up the groove from swing to Latin on the section before Sear gets his solo. As Steer starts working in the lower register, getting some love supremish uh, licks in there around the harmonies. Uh, he's playing hard, gets some real zing in his tone as he pushes higher and continues on with some hard blowing faster slide work. Sansom comes in next with a piano solo. He's got nice dancing right hand lines, clear articulation, but forceful punchy left hand chords. And he finishes up with more punchy two handed chord figures. The horns return with a more legato unison melody line arrangement. It really swings hard with syncopated accents and ties into part of the original melody, uh, then giving some time for trumpet and trombone to weave lines with added piano sprinkles as it slowly quiets down to the chugging bass. Track three is another Sear original, Eyes That Speak a Thousand Words. It's a quiet and sparse bass with soft cymbals to start it out. Piano adds some ringing low tones before the horns emerge with a fluffy rubato line. Bassford adds more cymbal and tom flourishes. Purse Glove adds embellishments and more improvisations around Sears' long tones. It swells to greater volume. Purse Glove really reaches with his rising figures. I think it's very soft and warm in his articulation. Austin gives some creeping motion with walking phrases underneath, and it comes to a softer ending under Samson's soft piano figures. It's a different kind of sound and type of tune, but it's very pretty. Track four, another Sear original visual balance. Uh, the drum intro lets us know we're in for some hard bop fun. Sear and Perzglove take the melody in unison. It's hard driving with phrases that build on each other, keeping a minor feel with a couple spots of major chord brightening. Sear is up first for a solo. He has a really good sear, like a sizzle mm -hmm. on his tone here and snap in his lines that include some creative harmonic turns. 
Sansom follows on piano, clear right-hand lines and rhythmic two-handed chords with bouncy ideas and some zippy right-handed figures as well. The horns come back with another new arranged melody line. It's tricky, but it swings really hard over just bass and drums. They tie it back into the original melody for one more go around and some fun on the ending. Track five, a version of Dave Brubeck's In Your Own Sweet Way. Uh, nice chiming piano and dancing cymbals for an intro. A seer comes in with the famous melody and then trades it off with Purs Club. Now their take on this tune, what they're doing with the version here, is to constantly change up the rhythmic fields as it goes along. Uh, and it's fun to follow these change-ups outlined in Basford's cymbals. Purse Club is up for a solo first. He sounds very lyrical here, but he's doing a lot of interesting creative ideas and phrasing over the shifting rhythmic feels below him. He has some fun fluttering high figures on the way, again taking chances, but always landing on his feet. Seer follows, fitting tricky figures and well-placed accented phrasers over the dangerous rhythmic changes below. Sansom solos next, hammering chords between little swinging figures, kind of latin -y ideas in some spots and speedy lines. He finishes up with some rhythmic chords for Seer to bring the melody back, giving Purs Glove another go as well. A cool ostinato bass and piano vamp after that gives Basford some time to do some tight drum soloing, and they end it with Seer playing part of the well-known melody phrase. Uh, so yeah, this was the most impressive track for me. Actually, I liked it a lot. <laughs> Must be really, although I liked a lot of this. Yeah, really hard to get your solo lines while you're thinking of all those rhythmic field change ups uh, on there. Um, yeah. So kind of a tricky one. Track six is a Joe Henderson tune, Inner Urge, and Sierra and Perslov take the choppy melody alone over the drums. It's tricky and syncopated. Purse Glove gets to blow a bit freely in spots as they work through it. Bass and piano join in for the next section with percussive chords from Sansom. The horn lines get more connection in the next part and have some really impressive soaring and tumbling unison phrases uh, that Seer and Purse Glove handle impressively. Purse Glove solos first. He's on a quest with lines that keep reaching up high here, like he's trying to fly, mm. uh, but starts and ends softly mm. and lyrically on both uh, ends of the solo. Seer solos next with really swinging phrases, working in the middle register and adding some higher cries in. Uh, they return to the choppy melody with some breaks for Basford to fill with drums and into the soaring and tumbling section to take it out. Track seven. Another Sierra original blues for Rocky Della Rascal. This is a swinging 12 bar blues. Sansom takes two choruses around on the piano to start it out. The horns come in with the melody that splits into harmony in spots for two times around as well. Seer solos first, swinging hard, powerful bluesy phrases, and also more creative harmonic ideas. The next chorus has a new horn arrangement with Purse Glove up high and really blowing it out. And the last four bars of the chorus are left to Bassford on the drums uh, into a bass solo uh, from Austin. He makes it melodic, keeps a great bounce going over uh, four choruses, I think. Uh, then we get a couple of choruses with more horn arrangements for the first four bars and Bassford soloing on the rest. Uh, they take it around the original melody a couple times to finish it out with a big bluesy finish. This one's good fun. And we're going to end up with another Seer original, Eyes That Speak a Thousand Words, uh, the alternate take. Yeah, we, we, yeah this yeah. is an alternate take of something we heard earlier. And so uh, as an alternate take, you can hear some differences. I noticed uh, Sansom's piano is a little bit different. He's got more kind of sprinkly things going on. Uh, Purse Glove is working a little bit more in the upper register, and there's some different bass uh, work with some jangling of the strings going on underneath. Uh, yeah, take a listen uh, for the little differences of what happened. You may prefer one yeah. over the other. Yeah, the track three version is a bit of a downer, but this one, the uh, I think it's the trumpet that kind of brings it a bit out of that. Yeah, he kind of really like rises funk up. Funk a bit. He really, yeah. yeah. So overall, I thought it's an impressive debut recording. It's hard swinging, cast in the hard bop tradition, but there are some freer moments harmonically. The arrangements are fun, don't always go where you expect. Uh, Seer has driving solos with creative ideas, and Purse Glove really impresses with his chops and cavalier solos, never afraid of taking risks. The rhythm section's tight, with intense solos from Sansom too. Uh, all fans of swinging and bopping trombone, will probably be in for a treat with this one. 
Yeah, I was um I actually saved this one to listen to last cuz I thought it would be kind of a downer given the title. I always thought my <laughs> thoughts were me. It sounds like a really introspective right, right. um kind of title. I figured out oh, we got some introspective uh jazz, but that's not the case at all. It's actually the exact opposite. It's it's, it's a mostly exuberant album with the exception of, of uh, Eyes That Speak a Thousand Words, which is really the only kind of down sort of beat um track on the album. I, I was taken mostly with the upbeat approach, um, and I, as I mentioned, uh, the track in your own sweet way with all those really yeah. weird <laughs> rhythmic changes. It was almost like a rhythm and change obstacle course. Yeah. You know, it's like it's fun. you got to get into the the music military. You know, yeah. to get through all jump of through those. the tires and then uh, swing right. on the ropes. Yeah, yeah. But I thought I also thought that piece brought out the best in the soloists. I mean, I think they they lived up to the challenge, and they actually wound up with some really interesting material in doing it yeah um they you know they had to really work and wound up coming with interesting spontaneous ideas um it sounds like an album that was fun to make i mean you said he uh was kind of like nervous about it or something i don't know it doesn't sound like that at all um yeah i would say don't let the ponderous title fool you and just kind of listen to this it's really uh uplifting yeah it uh swings really hard mm. yeah from across the pond that hard swing across the it's pond good. Yeah. All right. Next trombone choice is uh, from Ben Patterson. This one came out in okay. August, August 19th. It's on Origin Records, and it's called The Way of the Groove. And grooves you're going to get here? You do. I'd say this is a groove-driven album. Yeah. That's the whole idea behind the concept here. So let's take a look. Good title in that case. Yeah. So from Sepulpa, Oklahoma. Mm. Patterson started trombone in the sixth grade. He continued on his education at University of North Texas. So really good uh, jazz ensembles there. And then for over 20 years, he was a member of the Airmen of Note, uh, where he rose to the positions of lead trombonist and music director. And as a uh, military ensemble, even performed for presidents. And as the director there, he produced 10 Jazz Heritage Series recordings, including guests such as uh, Branford Marsalis, Randy Brecker, Christian McBride, and three standalone recordings uh, for the Airmen of Note as well. Uh, in 2016, he launched his Ben Patterson Jazz Orchestra with its first recording, Vital Frequencies, featuring Chris Potter, and got a couple other recordings even after that, uh, 2020. Ben Patterson Group 2021 Origin Records release Push the Limits. He's uh, played with the Afro Bop Alliance Big Band and the Joe McCarthy Vince Norman Big Band. We're going to hear some uh, of Joe McCarthy in this big band uh, next week, I think, when we do okay. our big band. In addition to all these performing things, he does some education work too for clinics and master classes for high schools, festivals, and the Jazz Education Network Conference. And he says of this recording, for this project, I wanted to combine my quest for memorable sing-along melodies and interesting harmonies with my love of music that grooves. But what is a groove? Yeah. It's more than merely a collection of great musicians. Groove is, in and of itself, a study, a discipline, and an art that transcends style. It's the fitting together of all the pieces, every rhythm and styling, through thoughtful arranging and intensive listening. It's a way of communicating and existing harmoniously with others. These have been my thoughts while putting this music together. The styles are varied. Funk, rock, reggae, go-go, hip-hop blues style shuffle and more i drew inspiration from the likes of tower of power james brown john schofield the breckard brothers and herbie hancock most of all i hope it's fun to listen to and gets people bobbing their heads <laughs> and it does hmm. so all songs here composed by ben patterson who's uh, the trombonist luis hernandez tenor sax sean purcell guitar harry appleman on hammond b3 organ there's some piano in there as well Paul Henry on bass, Todd Harrison on drums. We're going to start off with an uh, interesting title, Anniversary Patio. Uh, th <laughs> this one starts out with an eight-bar intro of funky bass and drums. Uh, Patterson and Purcell come in on the melody locked together on trombone and guitar. 
it's going to be a feature of this recording. It's kind of a unique combination. Uh, and Appleman comps yeah. out some choppy organ chords below. Uh, the melody has fun syncopation and staggered phrases with sax joining in along the way. Uh, Purcell lets some grungy guitar slip through before the final strain. Uh, Patterson's up for the first solo, and he gets up into the high register quickly with rhythmic lines, then shows off his flexible chops with some speedy slide work. And he keeps the groove always. Purcell really lets the dirty guitar ring out underneath. Uh, Appleman follows on organ with a funky solo, nicely changing up the tone, adding in some Leslie spin as he builds it up. Uh, next is Hernandez on tenor sax, starting out relaxed, but gets into some lines of flurrying notes, works up to some angsty squawking. It goes back to the opening bass and drum intro with organ added, and they take it through the melody once more. So a great groove to start things out. Yeah, this reaches some really funky awesomeness in the middle, <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering also, I'm just going to put this out there in case we hear from Ben Patterson. What is an anniversary patio? Can you tell us? <laughs> oh, yeah. What is it? <laughs> really, I'm, no I'm trying to get a picture in my head of this. I don't really don't know. <laughs> Track two, we've got uh, Here Now. Ringing distorted guitar and rhythmic bass figures get joined by drums and a set of slow, steady groove for the melody entrance of Patterson. Again, working in tandem with Purcell's guitar, the melody has some interesting rhythmic angular phrases and finishes up on a repeated rhythmic note. Appleman is up first for an organ solo. He gets to crunch in some tension-building chords among the weighty higher phrases that he churns out here. Purcell is next, starting with some sludgy ringing chords. Then he works into some really slicing, speedy licks. Uh, Henry and Harrison are really pounding out the groove on the drums and bass underneath. Patterson comes in next, relaxedly working around some harmonic possibilities before he rips into these double-time phrases, some cool triplet figures as well toward the end of his solo. They chill it down a bit for another round of the melody and then extend it out for some more jamming for trombone and guitar into some fast-arranged unison figures. Track three is FLT. It's a solo funky bass that starts this one out. It's joined by light clicky drumming and organ to make the groove. Patterson and Purcell again take the melody in unison. I like the unexpected modulation on the B section and the little solo trombone section before the final rhythmic melody ending. Uh, Purcell solos first with his edgy tone and choppy phrases, sometimes getting bluesy, sometimes getting more harmonic tension and using distortion together. Uh, he gets a long time to go on here, but he doesn't run out of creative ideas. Patterson's next locking tight rhythmic phrases into the groove and then working into some more outside harmonic ideas with rapid slide work. Keeps the ideas in power blowing straight through his solo. And I liked how they were all synced up on the phrase ends uh, rhythmically as they go through. Uh, once more around the melody, some tight drum fills on the final phrase. Now here's the winning title for the album, Stank Face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one's got a lickety split drum intro into a new funk feel groove. Appleman is on piano here, and this time Hernandez takes the melody with Patterson, uh, first in unison and then harmonized. There's a super funky section with a fat synth bass added down there too. Uh, Patterson comes out with a synth effect trombone uh, on his solo. It's cool. It adds like a bit of wah to the sound as he works some harmonically cool and speedy but always funky lines. Uh, Purcell follows with a really edgy solo in the upper register of the guitar. There's great bass fills from Henry behind him. Uh, they go through the funky section again and then add in some more percussion as a backing for Hernandez's solo on tenor uh, that has some gutsy phrases. Patterson and Hernandez work the melody riffs with some spots for Hernandez to blow more ideas and then some slicing from Purcell uh, before the uh, bone, sax, and bass are bare. And then it ends. Extremely funky number here. Yeah. Track five, the lucky one. This one's a bouncy reggae groove. Uh, Patterson starts out the melody, joined by Purcell. There are cool breaks uh, for bass fills along the way and groovy fills and beats from Harrison on drums. Henry gets a bass solo. It's acoustic, super tight and funky. I really like this bass solo. Uh, he mixes in some mm. harmonized ideas and lots of rhythmic variation over the clicky drum beats. Uh, Appleman follows on a swelling organ solo, and then the groove starts to cruise and change up, interestingly, a little bit there. Uh, Patterson follows on a rhythmic solo getting down low and then soaring high with snappy phrases. 
once more through the melody, and Patterson makes it sing out before a few more bass breaks in the end. We're going to get the title track six, The Way of the Groove. It's a busy subdivided groove with a killer bass line here. Uh, the melody is thick with guitar, trombone, and sax all working it. There's some breaks for speedy trombone and complementary sax lines before Patterson launches on an intense solo with snappy slide figures, full power blowing all the way. Hernandez follows, starting out smooth and snaky, then getting some blazing lines out of lower honks. Purcell gets another burning guitar solo next with double time lines and edgy licks. They take it through the tune once more with a slowdown at the end to some final unexpected chords. Great bass and drum work locking in on this tune and organ adds a lot of atmosphere swirling around the horn parts. Track 7 and 8 go together. Uh, track 7 is uh, the kind of intro to it. What happens next? It's a solo trombone from Patterson, showing off both his ringing tone and speedy chops with descending lines. The others join in with him uh, in a minor and slightly melancholy procession with Appleman on piano. Something is doubling the melody line of the trombone here, but I can't make out what it is for sure. You uh, mean in track seven? Yeah. Um, um, I don't know if he's got another I part, have, um, but... I think it's a... I don't know. It's not the sax. I didn't write it down, um, but the it's not the piano, is it? No. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure okay. if it's a clear-toned guitar, but I don't think so. Anyway, this okay. is the intro for the full tone of Because the only other thing I heard was the yeah. piano on this track, so yeah. Okay. Is uh, what happens next, the full track, eight, uh, mm -hmm. a minor melody from Patterson and Hernandez, having first harmonized and swirling lines above and then coming down low together. Uh, the beat is a slow Latin feel, but it has push from the bass. Appleman gets a piano solo. He focuses on touch and ringing notes. And Harrison has a subtle drum fill uh, thing going on beneath. And the horns come in for backing. Next is an electric bass solo from Henry, way up high and tight, and then getting some exquisite rhythmic funkiness. Trombone and sax come back for another melody strain into exchanging solo lines. Patterson soaring higher and higher and Hernandez matching and joining together. Uh, then there's a vocalized chant-like strain. That was kind of unexpected before mm -hmm. the horns return to the melody. Uh, they bring it down softer, build it up, and then slow it down to the final hesitated phrases. Track 9, This and That. Drum toms crescendo into a laid-back but funky groove. Guitar and trombone take the melody, and organ dances around with tight percussive phrases. The B section has a lifting feeling to it, and the groove rides a bit lighter. Patterson gets to solo a bit over the jangly nine chords on guitar before Appleman takes a solo on organ. He's got a different tone here and keeps it mostly clean to start. I like the mean little dissonances he works in toward the end. Uh, Purcell solos next with a killer tone and some deep reverb. Patterson is up next starting relaxed but working into some impressive busy slide work and low phrases. There's a little bass and drum break to cleanse the palate before another round of the melody with some interludes for Patterson to work uh, some more fast and high solo licks and Harrison mixes it up on the drums as they take it out. We'll end up with 10 hanging. It's a fun syncopated groove on this one in the bass and organ under a bouncy trombone and guitar melody. Uh, the B section changes to a shuffle feel with Patterson really soaring on the line before bringing it down to a low foghorn blast at the end. Uh, then he's off on a solo that really gets rocking over the shuffle beat. It modulates and kicks up even more. Uh, Purcell has some gnarly guitar in the left channel underneath. He gets his own solo next, and he's got a new effect here. It's like something that adds harmonics to it. Uh, but he does cool stuff with that, uh, including some shredding and raunchy rock riffs in there. Uh, they get back to the bouncy melody. Harrison gets some tight drum work around repeats of the melody descending phrases to the end with Patterson adding a big fat low tone to finish it up. So, as advertised, grooves galore, lots of variety, funk, yeah. reggae, shuffle, slow, fast, all fun stuff. Patterson's original tunes are catchy. The dual trombone and guitar lead idea is unique and works well. Uh, sometimes Hernandez swaps in on tenor or adds another voice along with fiery solos. Tight rhythm section, great electric and acoustic bass work from Henry, uh, tight drumming from Harrison, and 
Really nice organ playing and tones from Appleman and on piano as well. Purcell likes his grungy tones, but they kind of work well with the clean trombone tone. Uh, and his guitar solos are always really burning up. And Patterson shows uh, he's a powerful player, big chops, flexibility, and enough creative ideas to drive through. Long solos always following the groove and keeping his phrases locking in with the tight rhythmic precision. Yeah, this this one uh, goes directly into the uh, CD collection. I'm gonna I have to like need, this one. Gonna need this one. Yeah, just the combination of the grooves, and then you have the organ, and it's just all the sound. It was just great. I really liked it a lot. I seem to need grooves in my life at the moment. So when I hear like a mm. good groove oriented album, I, I'll tend to get it these days. It really, this album really hit the spot for me. It was appealing all around. I liked Patterson's way of staying in the pocket of the groove during his solos too. He didn't really ever play against. No, no, like his, the rhythm. It just kind of yeah. So that that's that groove orientation mm -hmm. again. Yeah, yeah. His slide yeah, work yeah. really, you know, it's it's hard to do on trombone too because you've got to have that, you know, your chops and your wrist right. really laying those lines into the pocket. But he does that really well. Yeah, I actually found the album uplifting too. Mm. It went by fast, and uh, as was uh, you know the previous one we just talked about. Um, I always thought my thoughts were me. It was also a pretty uplifting album. So uh, you're two for two this week. Right. And I think I might, uh, I may have to pick up actually all three of yeah. these jazz albums because I really like them all. But this one was my favorite, The uh, I, uh, the Way of the Groove. This mm. was my favorite of the three. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of variety of uh, grooves there. Yeah, who would have thought I would pick up three trombone albums in one week? Yeah. If I weren't on this podcast, I wouldn't have any <laughs> trombone albums in my collection. Probably, that's what happens when you you, you co-host with a with a brass player. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna get uh, one of my old favorites, Steve Trey, uh, with his new album yeah. on Smoke Session Records, Generations. And so the idea here is S Steve Trey came up uh, as a young player with. Uh, the jazz masters, Art Blakey, uh, Roland Kirk, Woody Shaw, which is how I mm. came to know his playing, uh, listening to all those yeah. uh, Woody Shaw records from the 70s and uh, into the 80s when I was young and impressionable in high school. I heard, because I really liked Woody Shaw's advanced harmonic concepts, and I said, oh, who's this awesome trombone player uh, on these recordings? And that was Steve Turay. And so... Now he's uh, kind of an elder statesman of jazz and trombone, sounding as good as ever. The idea here is he's going to bring in some of these uh, older, experienced jazz masters and get some young blood in there as well. And uh, so what he does here is brings in his own son dr on drums, Orion Touré, as well as uh, Wallace Roney Jr. So Wallace Roney, the great uh, jazz trumpeter who passed away a few years back. Uh, and this is his son who really impresses me a lot here. And we've got a, another young uh, member on piano, Isaiah J. Thompson. Uh, more on him later. And uh, bassist uh, Corcoran Holt. Uh, this is uh, Trey's quote. Uh, There's a balance between youth and age. Age brings wisdom and knowledge and youth brings enthusiasm and energy. Playing with each of them stretches me in a different way. The elders stretch me in ways of wisdom, but the youngsters fire it up. All of that is inspiring. And uh, he continues on to say, uh, I always like to play with musicians that challenge me. So coming up, I would usually play with people older than me. My challenge now comes from the youthful energy of the younger players. Jazz is not dead. Yeah, I don't want to... I, I think that's one of the great things about music in general is just the... Uh interchange of ideas between generations of players. I mean, you don't really get that in any other field, do yeah. you? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because usually it's the older people who are in charge all the time and stuff. But yeah. uh, music... Uh, no, no, no. We've got to have that mix. Yeah. yeah interchange. So we've yeah. got a, a wide cast of musicians here. Uh, Steve Turay himself, trombone, and the requisite conch shells on one track. <laughs> Always love to hear those. Wallace yeah. Roney Jr. on trumpet and uh, flugelhorn on one track. We've got uh, Emilio Modeste, tenor and soprano sax, uh, James Carter on one track on tenor sax, uh, Ed Cherry on guitar, one track, uh, Isaiah J. Thompson on piano throughout, uh, Trevor Watkiss on one track, Rhodes Piano, Corcoran Holt on bass on some tracks, as well as the great Buster Williams on some tracks, uh, Derek Barnett 
on electric bass on one track. Orion Trey, Steve Trey's son on drums. Also Lenny White on three tracks on drums. Call Wright on one track. Petrito Martinez on additional percussion. And Andy Basford on one track of guitar too. And I'll point out they're playing as we go along. This was recorded in on March 29th, uh, I guess just one day in 2022 here. Recorded, mixed, and mastered by Chris Allen, uh, assistant engineer Stephen Sacco. And uh, so it's got that great Smoke Sessions uh, sound to it. Uh, the sound quality is good. And all tunes here, except number four, are by Steve Ture. We'll talk about that when we get there. Hmm. Uh, so the first one is Planting the Seed. That's C-E-E-D. And uh, that's in reference to the great jazz pianist, Cedar Walton, who Steve Turi mm -hmm. had an association with. And so this one starts out with a bass and low piano riff that's answered by rhythmic piano chords. It's got a minor modal mood to it with a loping swing feel. A trombone and sax enter with staggered three-note rising riffs and join in with the trumpet that answers with the falling line. Uh, there's more bass and piano riffing, and then the horns move into the melody that's broken up for drum fills uh, from Orion Touré. The B section has brighter harmonies, and the feel changes up to Latin with nice cymbal work from Orion. Emilio Modeste solos first on tenor sax, starting with fast light phrases. He alternates low register swinging phrases, faster double time lines, and some clipped articulation, uh, ending with a few pitch bendy ideas before Ture takes over. Uh, he's got that full trombone tone blowing relaxedly, but with intense swing feel and nice harmonic ideas over the Latin beat sections. He has some fun with repeated rhythmic notes and ends with a bluesy idea. Next is Wallace Roney Jr. on trumpet. It's a bright and clear tone. I like his phrasing a lot. He leaves tons of space between his ideas, lets you digest them. Uh, rather than speedy phrases here, he focuses on melodic development. Then we've got Isaiah Thompson next on piano. Uh, he starts with rhythmic ideas, keeps returning to them between more flourishing higher right hand lines. And they return to the main melody line for another round and take it out with the bass piano vamp and a little horn line into some final drumming into the last note. Uh, it's a fun tune with fresh harmonies and melodic ideas. Track two, Dinner with Duke. And you can guess who the Duke is, the great Duke right. Ellington. And I guess this was inspired because uh, Steve Trey says that his parents took him to the Oakland Auditorium to see Duke Ellington in 1957 when he had just begun playing wow. trombone. Uh, so it must have made a big impression. Uh, this one starts with a rubato rolling piano, arpeggios, and little trickles uh, with cymbals that make an intro into a slow ballad for Trey to take the lead on. Uh, piano chords and Ellington-esque little trickles, those graceful little things, uh, yeah. and soft drum brushwork and bass pulsing underneath. Trey plays it prettily, but he adds sassy little slides to it. Roni and Modeste come in with soft horn backing lines. It's in a very slow four, but the rhythm section leaves Ture on his own on sections, coming in on accented hits to good effect. Uh, Ture is mostly in the warm middle and lower registers and sounds great, ending the melody on a higher note that releases gently. Uh, Thompson gets a piano solo next, and he keeps it sparse and light, evoking Ellington-type images. Trey returns for a plunger solo. Uh, it's very intimate and voice-like. Roni joins in with a Harmon muted trumpet for a line above him, and they weave their lines together. Uh, next, a bowed bass solo from Corker and Holt. Uh, he's sawing very gently here. Uh, it works well, mm. staying mostly in the higher register, but it will move your woofers a bit when he gets down low there with the bow. Trey returns Those with woofers need to work out. Yeah, <laughs> part of the melody <laughs> into what I thought was going to be a cadenza, but no, uh -huh. it turns out to be an incredibly long held note that he slides uh -huh. up and then down, uh, <laughs> and the piano and the horns form chords around his tone into the last cadence and a final uh, few soft trombone phrases. This is just beautiful. That's all you can say. Nice dedication and uh, stylistic tune in for Duke Ellington. 
Track three, Blue Smoke. Uh, a shuffling blues that Ture starts out on his own with some bluesy lip work. There are some tasty guitar fills from Ed Cherry between his phrases. Roni and Modeste add a horn phrase on the final turnaround of the blues uh, structure. It's Lenny White shuffling on the drums on this tune. Uh, Ture takes it around the head again, and there are more horn lines added in, and then he continues on for a solo. It's bluesy and playful. Uh, Modeste is next on tenor. He starts out relaxed, works into more double-time lines as uh, Ture and Roni push him along with backing lines. Cherry follows with an understated solo featuring some repeated notes into bluesy licks and then double stop lines. Thompson is up next on piano uh, with a rollicking rhythmic solo. And finally, Buster Williams has a bouncy bass solo. He's always got that big fat tone that comes through on any recording you hear him on. Uh, the horns kick in with some cool bluesy riffs to push his solo through the last chorus. And then Trey brings back the bluesy head for another run through and some repeated final phrases uh, with a fun final rhythmic horn line. Now we're going to get the uh, one standard here, Jerome Kern. Otto Harbach's smoke gets in your eyes. Uh, Therese says, I've, n I've never heard a trombone play that song, but I didn't want to do it the same way everybody else does it. So I put a little bit of African 6-8 six, six, rhythm to it. Yeah, he certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is one of my favorite songs, in fact, in general. So I was happy to hear A little this. unique version here. Uh, it's a little intro yeah. uh, that gets you acquainted with that rhythm. Uh, with Latin percussion and cymbals over piano chords. Uh, then the percussion silences in some bright, chimey piano chords lead into the melody from Ture. Uh, he's starting way down low in the register here, and it sounds very cool. Uh, listen to the bass line and left-hand piano movement underneath what he's playing, too. Really good stuff happening. The rhythm gets broken up playfully on the bridge. Uh, Ture continues into a solo. He plays lyrically, but the unique rhythms inspire him to have a dance-like quality to his phrasing. Thompson has a piano solo next, mixing more free-flowing right-hand lines that alternate with more rhythmic ideas uh, that lock in together with Williams's bass. And Trey joins back in, takes it around the melody again, adding some more improvisations with rising lines, and then taking it down gently over some final piano trickles. Really nice. Track five, we get two reggae tunes in one episode. Uh, that's never happened before. Yeah, right. uh, Don D, and this is a tribute to the legendary Scottalites trombonist Don Drummond. Boy, now mm. talk about deep bass. Uh, you're going to get some deep electric bass from Derek Barnett on this tune. Uh, and then drums lock in with him on a reggae beat. Uh, Modeste and Roni work together with Ture on the tightly harmonized minor melody. Andy Basford has some great scratchy muted guitar underneath that's in your left ear. And Trevor Watkiss is over on the right with tight Rhodes chords. Uh, this different instrumentation, different feel, different players on this tune. Trey jumps out with a sliding cry to start a solo. Uh, he plays mostly short rhythmic phrases, but they have a real vocal-like quality to them. Watkins follows with a road solo, and he keeps it mostly sparse and rhythmic. Uh, next, there's a section of new arranged horn lines that have Trey playing descending figures and the trumpet and sax answering with rising tones. Uh, Roni comes out of that with the trumpet solo. He blows bluesy licks and some puckish higher phrases, leaving again lots of tasty space. Uh, Basford is next on guitar uh, with some tasty pitch bends tight licks and ringing high tones once more through the original horn melody and they tag on the split uh, arrangement we heard in the middle to make an ending for the piece then as we mentioned sad this week uh, yesterday pharaoh sanders passing and this is a tune for him pharaoh's dance actually it's a joint tribute uh, for pharaoh sanders and pianist mccoy tyner Trey starts it out with a rubato trombone over percussion and rolling piano. Uh, he starts modally minor lines that go into more of a melody. It slows and quiets with final piano trickles. Rodney, Modesto, and Trey burst back in uh, with the muscular minor modal melody over a steady Latin beat. The B section contrasts with a more subdivided feel marked out nicely by, again, Orion Trey's cymbals. Roni solos first. Here, he's more animated, 
with ideas uh, evoking uh, both his father's playing and I thought a lot of Woody Shaw type of uh, harmonic sense things. Although his final line is a Freddie Hubbard like uh, rip up uh, to finish the solo off, but uh, yeah, good attention to the former masters of trumpet. Chere follows. He has lots of tight little slide figures mixed in with more lyrical phrases. And Thompson is next on piano. Impressive skittering right hand figures. Uh, the horns join in backing for a bit and Thompson sticks on a bluesy lick and then some rhythmic left hand ideas. They take it around that horn melody once more and then vamp out for some more improvisations from Chere and Roni. Now we're going to get a really uh, unique track, Flower Power, track seven. Oh, uh, yeah. This was kind of the standout yeah. for me in the, in the sense that it was really different yeah. and very unexpected as well. It's got this lullaby-like bass it's, uh, and left-hand piano line that gets uh, kind of added piano chords over lightly dancing uh, cymbals. Uh, the horns pop in with a line, and, and they do pop, uh, but the, the line turns more legato and floats downward. And then we're back to that bass and piano cycle for a while. It really gets you into sort of a trance. Once again, the horn line comes back in. Next, uh, Ture comes in all warm and fluffy, uh, but he soon turns playful. Roni and Modeste on soprano sax here weave lines around him, and then they join together on the descending line as uh, Thompson zips these dreamy like, piano lines uh, underneath all of that, and he continues on playing. I kind of interpreted this piece actually because it's called Flower Power, mm. and I thought that the uh, the piano with its kind of sprayed arpeggios was sort of like uh, the spreading of flowers, you know, mm. like hippie style, sort of like in the '60s. You know, Could I kind of had this whole hippie sort of <laughs> <laughs> kind of interpretation for this. Mm. There's more to come, but uh, yeah, yeah. You know, let's go through the uh, next. The a uh, new horn line that's rising comes in, and under that, uh, Lenny White's on drums. It, he makes it really intense under that line. Um, Thompson brings back the tinkling piano again. Uh, that sets the stage for the uh, Therese Conch show solo. His playing yeah. and the whole dreamy setting, I said, I feel transported to a tropical island on another planet. <laughs> it's really, uh, you know, unusual atmosphere uh, here. Yeah, for this, I said, I think everybody's using non-aggressive, smooth sounds, however unnatural, to put the flower power theme across. It really <laughs> does feel like this 1960s, everybody's yeah. like very gentle and, you know, kind of, they're going to have a love in or something and they're kind of trying to yeah you know, stay off each other's like uh, darker side or something like that. And the piano keeps uh, tinkling its pedals as the track does a natural fade at the end. Yeah. yeah. And there's always something. <laughs> I, I got a, I, yeah, I got a hippie theme from this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's that primal quality to the, uh, his shell sound, you know, the way he uses right. the hand and yeah. the, the pitches. Um, and then he, it's kind of a good track to use that on, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it gets the atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. Then he gets it into a rhythmic groove. Roni and Modeste add some more lines. Uh, into another unison descending thing. Uh, Thompson keeps tinkling the piano, and the horns come back uh, with the rising line, and White beats it up again underneath there. And then they return to the original horn line as it quiets over the piano figures and bass to end. So a little dreamy journey mm -hmm. there. Track 8, Good People. Percussion and drums from White and Martinez here. Uh, it's a bouncy bass groove from Williams and Piano that make an intro for this Latin beat tune. The horns come in with the melody, which is made up of repeating phrases that, a repeating phrase that changes with the harmonies, harmonies. The last phrase of the A section ends with rising syncopated piano chords. And then the B section has more static notes and a different repeating type of figure. Uh, there's a little percussion interlude over the groove before Roni starts his trumpet solo. It's a really nice lyrical singing tone with melodic lines and quite a few pregnant pauses. Uh, he's a very thoughtful soloist. Ture picks up on his last lick and uses it as an idea to start out his own solo. Also, he's playing very lyrical, but having some fun with rhythmic pauses and some rapid figures at the end. And then Thompson follows on piano. He's got some spring-loaded rhythmic right-hand lines and then some accented chords into a vamp that leads to a percussion feature with uh, conga and some scratching percussion things there. Uh, once more through the melody with a soft slowdown of the horns. Track 9 is Sweet Dreams. 
Uh, this one's got a rising line from Touré into the ballad that it becomes. Uh, he makes the melody sing over brushwork uh, from his son here and little rolling figures in the piano. Next time around, he's joined by James Carter on tenor sax for some harmony. And I think this James Carter is uh, Regina Carter, the violinist's cousin, mm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Carter himself gets a strain of the melody, and he plays it in that uh, kind of old style with the wavering vibrato. And right, yeah. Roni has a, added another soft line on top, and he continues on as Ture takes the melody and Carter joins in again. Buster Williams then gets a bass solo. It's a nicely melodic one. There's some clear articulated phrases and then these very cool rubbery sliding ideas. Uh, it sounds really good. And Ture follows with a Harmon muted solo, uh, giving himself a muffled voice-like quality. And Carter gets a solo next. This is a, a really nice solo. I mean, it's the only tune he plays on, but he makes it stand out. Uh, it builds in intensity uh, through rhythmic rising figures, reaches a, a wailing tone up high, and then uh, diving soft and low to finish it up. And Thompson's up next on piano, a classy kind of Ellington-esque quality to the figures in his lines. Then Carter brings back the melody uh, next with Roni adding a line before Ture takes over and gets a final warm low phrase. We're going to finish it up with a track called Resistance, number 10. Ture starts out with an ostinato line. That gets joined by bass here, played by uh, Corcoran Holt uh, on this tune. And then piano, which adds some variations, uh, sometimes dissonant on the final chords. Uh, Orion Ture make, uh, marks out the swing feel on the cymbals. The melody is a cool syncopated rising minor horn line uh, that gets to float on its own as the rhythm section drops out uh, for sections of it. Uh, there's a contrasting brighter B section uh, that kicks up into a Latin beat. Ture takes the first solo, starting with some bluesy and rhythmic phrases. He blows it out more with uh, reaching lines on the Latin groove sections. Roni's next, mixing bluesy phrases and some more reaching harmonic ideas over the changing grooves. Uh, sometimes he leaves so much space, I just think he's just <laughs> finished play, uh, but then he yeah, comes right. back in. Modeste comes up next uh, with the soprano solo. He starts kind of tamely uh, with more clipped phrases, but he gets more frantic and out there as he goes along with some fast lines and a, f a few high squawks. And then Thompson wraps up the solos on piano, hammering out a bluesy and rhythmic solo uh, with some two-handed synced lines in the middle. And Ture brings back the opening ostinato with the bass, but he drops out and leaves it to the bass and piano as they cycle around on it uh, for the younger Ture to do some drum work. Before the snaky melody returns, uh, Roni taking the last line high to the finish. So this is another great release from Steve Ture. As always, great original tunes, uh, cool arrangements, and trombone playing that can be both voice-like and intimate, or large and in charge, depending on what's called for. The mix of generations idea works out well. The Elder Statesman with Ture, Buster Williams, uh, Ed Cherry, and the young Thompson on piano here. He just graduated Juilliard in 2019. Adds a lot of tasty piano and is up on his uh, Ellington touches. I thought uh, Orion Ture holds down the drums very well. I was impressed by his cymbal work, keeping the grooves, and really, really impressed by Wallace Roney Jr.'s trumpet solos. Uh, he's a very intelligent player, thinking carefully and never overplaying or just trying to show off. Uh, the other players who guest on the tracks uh, give each tune a unique feel. We've got swing, Latin, ballads, reggae, and then the dreamy conch shell uh, feature flower power. Uh, what more do you want? Well, I have well, most of Steve Therese recordings on CD, and I want this one too. Yeah, I guess I'm going to have to get this one too. Not least because it's on the Smoke Sessions label, which always sound fantastic. This is no exception. I mean, it's it's a great sounding recording too. Therese, he, we, I mentioned at the beginning that Pharaoh Sanders, he had this real, you know, he wasn't really blowing hard towards the end of his life, but he had this real like presence. You kind of right. knew it was him among the other musicians. Well, Ture has that yeah. too. I mean, you, you you know it's him. It's a big sound and it grabs the attention. It's a gravitas. And I really liked, yeah, yeah I really liked him. I guess that comes with age or from yeah. lots of playing. Because young players generally don't have that. Like, And they'll they'll 
instead they'll kind of like you know blow out or play hard instead but mm. i think as you go on you kind of figure out how to do that which is pretty interesting the ensemble is pretty tight of course um they they clearly listen to each other um and i like the way like the soloist would like pick up the other soloist line the previous one and then kind of continue it or just go in another direction but they'd always start mm. from that place that's not always the case but in this album it is i really like that approach a lot yeah it's an enjoyable album very it's straightforward the track flower power kind of stands out because it's just so different from everything else on the yeah. album yeah <laughs> it's, it's a it's such a stylistic change but i really liked it just because it was so odd you know it's a, it's a, a real they took a real chance putting it on there and i thought it was interesting yeah so again i guess there you go three trombone albums going into my uh my really Mostly trombone free CD <laughs> collection. Not anymore, though. Not anymore. I don't know. I like the trombone, but I mean, I just didn't listen to it much. And now here no. we are. Well, I am. I've, I'm on the adult music podcast that I am hearing lots more music. And you can too, listener. Yeah, I've got most of uh, yeah. Therese's uh, recordings. Uh, some of them are uh, have multiple trombone players and multiple conch shell players, like an ensemble things with really, really cool arrangements. We'll throw them on next time you come over. And uh, check some of them out. Oh, okay. Yeah, really good stuff. That'll be great. Yeah. What's that? That's not probably going to be until Christmas when we do our Christmas episode. Yeah, well, maybe we can do a Thanksgiving <laughs> thing or something. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, is there Thanksgiving music out there? I don't know. Yeah, we'll make it up. Oh, speaking of Christmas, I should mention that uh, jazz fans of Vince Guaraldi's A Charlie Brown Christmas is coming out as a box set. Oh, nice. With um, studio outtakes on it in uh, October. So I'm. Just being a big fan, it's such a famous record yeah. to begin with, especially around Christmas time. I guess I'm going to have to pick that up too. Yeah. <laughs> so look forward to that. Lots of stuff to look forward to. I think next week we're going to go big again, orchestral and uh, big band. Orchestral. Yeah. For for classical, it's going to be lots of Beethoven. Now you got to be asking yourself, well, why are we going to hear these Beethoven symphonies again? Well, I've got two. Um, I wouldn't say unique, but you know, slightly different takes on. Uh, oh. Well, not no, nah, they're not different takes, but they're um, d just elements of them really stand out. Mm. And I think I wanted to talk about that. So I've got two Beethoven recordings, and then we've got a um. Both oh, both of those Beethoven albums also have a work by a contemporary composer, and I'll also put in a um, contemporary composer at the end, too, by a Latvian woman composer whose name, at the moment, I can't pronounce. <laughs> That's going to be part of my research for this week to find out how to say this uh, this composer's name. I'll let you know who it is next All week. Right. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to uh, check out those recordings after you hear this podcast, uh, you can come over to the Deezer adult music channel and and find out the uh all the all the uh recordings in one place on our playlist and i also have that uh, posted on our facebook page too so if you want to hear the music ahead of time uh you can get a jump start listening to those recordings yeah the spelling of this uh, woman's name is absolutely horrifying i don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how i'm gonna get, get my uh, to, mouth around this week thing. To work it out, right? i got a week to figure it out i'm gonna have to do a lot of searches and hopefully someone will say it. I don't know how to say this name. Boy, All right. Well, taking a big chance. Cutting my work's cut out for me this week. <laughs> thanks again to Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo. And remember to uh, look for the playlist. Uh, come on over, see us on Facebook to get some uh, additional little musical tidbits and new releases that come out during the week as I find them. I'll try to put up some classical ones too. I had two. No, that's what, I should really put something like Hardenberger up too. Hmm. I'll, tell you, I'll take you'll a look see and see if there's any find something. So this has been yeah. episode 82 of Adult Music, and we'll be back with some orchestral Beethoven and big band blast for episode 83 next week. I can hardly wait. So keep listening. Me too. I think <laughs> I can hardly. I don't know. Is that, is that two or neither? What, what goes with that? Huh. I want to do this episode too. <laughs> Wait till next week. That's what I want yeah. to say. All right. We'll see you again next week for some new music. So until then, keep listening. Mm -hmm.